All right. Welcome everyone to the Tuesday, October 19th, 2021 regular meeting of the Walnut Creek City Council. The City Council is conducting this meeting from the City Council Chamber and staff are complying with the current regulations of the California Department of Public Health and Cal OSHA for safe indoor meetings. We're re continuing to allow for remote public comments via Zoom in addition to in-person comments. We require that all in-person attendees wear masks consistent with Contra Costa County health orders. And that includes while speaking during comments. As some attendees may be participating in their first Walnut Creek City Council meeting, I wanted to welcome everyone and talk briefly about the public comment process. For each agenda item, there will be an opportunity for public comment on the item. Thus, if you desire to speak to an item on the agenda this evening, please hold your comments until the council considers that item. Additionally, we have a section on the agenda uh, titled Public Communications, which is for public comments for items not on the agenda. Any comments during public communication should not relate to an item that is on the agenda this evening. Consistent with Section 9.5 of the City Council Handbook, 30 minutes will be initially allocated for public communications for items not on the agenda. Additional time for public communications for items not on the agenda will be provided at the end of the open session portion of the meeting if necessary. This process is consistent with Section 9.5 of the City Council Handbook and will allow for all public comments to be received during the meeting for items not on the agenda. When I open the public comment period, use the raised hand feature or press star nine if you're connected by audio only, which will alert staff that you have a public comment you would like to provide. We ask that everyone who wishes to speak on an item, please use the raised hand feature to state your intent to speak when that item is called. If you're attending in person, please complete a speaker identification card and line up behind the lectern at the appropriate time. Please wait your turn and once brought into the meeting, state your name and city of residence for the record. Please keep in mind this is a city business meeting. The City Council has adopted rules of decorum to ensure that meetings are conducted efficiently and effectively and that all members of the public have a full, fair and equal opportunity to be heard. All remarks should be addressed to the City Council. Please do not use profanity during your comments. Given the COVID-19 pandemic and the increased number of speakers that have wanted to make comments on various issues during our meetings and consistent with city policies related to public comments, each speaker will have two minutes to make your remarks. The Zoom feed for each speaker will cut off automatically at two minutes. The council will accept oral comments. Written comments submitted have been and will be posted to the city's website for public review and are included in the meeting record but will not be separately read into the record. To provide a live remote public comment, you join the Zoom video conference meeting. The meeting ID is 879-3418-9476. The passcode is 853159. Should you choose to not provide comments, but would like to view the meeting, you may do so in one of the following ways. YouTube Live, you can visit the City of Walnut Creek's YouTube channel. Cable Broadcast, Comcast Channel 28 in the incorporated Walnut Creek area. Rossmore Channel 26, Wave Channel 29, and AT&T UVerse Channel 99. Or you can live stream it online at the City's website. And at this time, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Would the city clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Darling? Here. Councilmember Haskew? Here. Councilmember Silva? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Francois? Here. And Mayor Wilt? Aye. Here. Aye. <laughs> we'll get to that later. <laughs> First, we've got a presentation from the Youth Commission, and if uh, the Youth Commissioner or representative would come on up, looks like Rebecca. For the Youth Commission, and I'm honored to showcase the highlights of last year's Youth Commission as well as introduce our 2021 2022 Commission. Is there a specific place I pointed to? You had it. 
So the commission's purpose is to engage the future leaders of Walnut Creek's youth by encouraging them to take an active by encouraging them to take an active leadership okay. ro role in our community. And after serving on the youth commission for the past term, I can wholeheartedly say that the commission has truly deepened my understanding of local government as well as being able to work with 14 other amazing individuals from across Walnut Creek is truly rewarding. So even though last year we struggled with functioning in a work from home world, we were able to make the situation work. It's funny to think that this time last year we were conducting the same introduction meeting over Zoom as you can see on the picture to the right. And although we were on Zoom for the majority of the year, we were able to connect with other commission commissioners as you can see us enjoying a Thanksgiving dinner on the left. And when we did finally get to meet in person in July, it was great to attach the little Zoom squares to actual human bodies. So every year, the Youth Commission takes on three main projects. And last year, our three main task force were a policy project, so a youth seat on every commission, a community cleanup that took place on April 27th at uh, Borges Ranch, as well as an Instagram informative campaign. We also took on two projects, the Duncan Arcade Mural, as well as the Piano Projects. To introduce the projects, I'll let three other representatives um, talk about their time and their experience with them. Um, good evening, council members. This past year marked the inception of the Youth Commission's first ever policy project. Called A Seat at the Table, the implementation of this policy would create a position for one youth member on every commission in Walnut Creek. A survey that measured that uh, measured how represented youth in Walnut Creek felt was sent out to many schools in the city and the results of this survey clearly indicated that an increase in youth representation was necessary. The subcommittee also presented their idea to all the city's commissions as well as the public education committee in order to gain feedback. This is an essential step in opening up opportunities for youth representation in our city. On April 24th of this year, we held a community. Speak closer to the mic. So on April 24th of this year, we were proud to host a community cleanup uh, event at the Borges Ranch open space, um, which we were, which was aided by um, park ranger Corey Frazier, who helped us along the way um, in organizing the event. And we were proud to uh, gather more than 20 volunteers um, who collected upwards of uh, more than five bags of trash and walked more than five miles along the trails um, cleaning up. And uh, we're proud to have Mayor, uh, Council Member Haskey with us as well. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, and we um, really appreciated being able to see all of the um, passionate citizens. We're also walking around the trails that day and commented on what we were doing with the commission. And um, we we're proud to tell them that we were representing the city of Walnut Creek. Got to adjust it. Good evening, Council. Um, so I'm here to present our last project, which is a social media informational campaign that we ran from January 2021 to around August 2021, near the end of the term. And so our main goal with this is just to provide information to our community, to the youth in our community through social media. Um, throughout a time of distance living, uh, social media was one of the best ways that we could communicate with people. And so we try to use that to our advantage. So if you look up there, there's a couple of our graphics. Um, so we did, every month we did four posts. Um, each month had a topic and the four posts were kind of subtopics in between. Um, so some examples are we did Black History Month. We talked about COVID back in January. Uh, and we did a partnership with Slowdown Wanna Creek. So yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Propti, um, Colin, and Jolene for covering the, the three projects that we did. As someone who worked on the policy project, it was really interesting to uh, get a deeper understanding of how passing an ordinance works, and I am very excited for how the project will look in this new term. So for the other two projects we worked on, the first one was the piano project, which we worked on with Andrea from Walnut Creek downtown to revamp this piano. Our goal with this piece of artwork was to really represent the youth of Walnut Creek. So the sill on the piano um, has 14 uh, teens from Walnut Creek holding up a sign saying, we are the future. 
Um, and the top of the piano is a map of Walnut Creek that was inspired by this house right across Elman Avenue that has a map of, um, I believe, the East Bay area, but we just made it so it's more of Walnut Creek, and it shows Los Lomas and Northgate, two schools there, as well as Broadway Plaza and Shell Ridge, some places that we, um, and honestly, all of Walnut Creek frequent uh, quite often. It was also really great to see how much the community loved the piano. I was just visiting the piano last weekend with a friend and was introduced to Lauren's Salsa Dance Company, which is pictured in the slide. So Lauren has been giving piano lessons on our city piano and introducing a lot of the kids and adults to this beautiful instrument. And as a piano player myself, I'm so glad that this project uh, is introducing so many more people to the instrument, and I hope that we can do some things similar to this in the future. Uh, lastly, the commission also worked on the Duncan Arcade mural. The mural is a wayfinding uh, mural placed above the alley on North Main Street. This mural showcased 12 youth uh, of Walnut Creek artists as they painted either digi digitally or physically on a letter. The youth commission was given the letter R and I designed the letter myself and it's just the 2021, 20, 2020, 2021, excuse me, youth commission against the um, Walnut Tree. So serving on the Youth Commission last year was one of the best experiences of my life, and I cannot wait for what this term will bring. Um, and I'm honored to introduce our new commission and let them tell you what they're excited for. Great, thanks. And actually, uh, just to give a little, uh, a little synopsis on your bio, when you introduce yourself, uh, tell us your grade and which school you're going to. Hello again. Um, thank you so much to Rebecca for giving us a great introduction. Um, those projects like the Piano Project and the Duncan Arcade Mural are so special to me because it's not only showing um, the youth in Winter Creek, but it's showing them permanently. It's always going to be there. You can always point to it when you're walking through Broadway Plaza, and I just think it's a beautiful thing. So my name is Jerlene Chu. I am a junior at Northgate, and this is my third year on the commission. And I will be talking about why I am most excited for this term. So with a new term comes a lot of new opportunities for change in our community. And one of the most obvious and big changes that we have been going through in the past month is coming back in person, back to a more normal, if I can even say that, or more COVID-free life, I guess. And it's a huge change, of course, because you can see my whole body right now instead of a little box. And I didn't have to hit unmute to speak to you guys. So. With that comes a lot of new and exciting things of returning back to a, quote, normal life. And although the Youth Commission stayed very active in the community throughout distance, um, us not being physically there did leave out a little something. And I'm very glad to be back in person this year to help facilitate change face to face. So thank you guys for having us this evening. And I will pass it on to the next commission member. Thank you. Hello, okay, hello. Uh, my name is Richard O'Donnell. I am in 11th grade and I attend the college preparatory school in Oakland. And my question was, why do you wanna serve on the Youth Commission this year? Um, one reason I applied to the Youth Commission this year is in order to experience two of my greatest dream jobs at the same time, which are city, city leadership and civic engineering. Um, this opportunity that I have been given to serve on the commission is not only great because of that, but also um, because it takes place in my hometown, Walnut Creek, which is one of my favorite cities, if not my favorite city. Um, and also because I get to uh, participate in projects with like-minded people who love the city just as much as me, who also fit into the same age group um, as me, uh, high schoolers. Um, so. Before I applied, I didn't know that this perfect blend of dream job, city location, and age group uh, could exist right in my backyard. But then I, you know, I saw the advertisement in the uh, magazine, and I applied, and I've been appointed, and I'm seeing it with my own eyes right in front of me. Um, so it's something that I've always wanted to participate in, but I just didn't know it existed until uh, a few months ago. And so I want to say um, thank you for inviting me into this space, and I'm excited to see what we can do in the future together. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Good evening again. Uh, my name is Prapti Prasan, and I'm a junior at Northgate High School. 
I'm extremely honored and grateful to be representing Walnut Creek Youth for the, my third year. Um, as a member of the Youth Commission's Policy Subcommittee, this year I am most excited to see our project move forward through the government process. Last year, the Commission was able to make a tremendous impact on Walnut Creek, even though we were all on Zoom. So I can only imagine the massive impact that we're going to have this year that we're all reunited in the third floor conference room. Thank you, and I look forward to another great term with the Youth Commission. Thanks, Profty. So our next commissioner, unfortunately, could not make it here today. Um, but this is Justine Simmons. Um, she is a junior at Los Lomas, and this is her first uh, year on the Youth Commission. Um, and this year, she hopes to gain an understanding of community through the Youth Commission and find ways to help others become more involved in our city, thus fostering an even better sense of community. And I am Abigail Stouffer. I'm a junior at Crondelet High School, and this is my third year on the commission. Um, and I'm going to keep it pretty short and sweet here. But I wanted to serve on the Youth Commission um, in, because we have the opportunity to lift up not only our own voices, but the voices of our peers as well. Being on this commission is a great honor, and it also comes with a great responsibility I know that none of us will take lightly. So thank you, and I can't wait for another year. Thanks, Abigail. Uh-oh. Oh, no. <laughs> there we go. Oh. Uh, hello, council members. Oh. Uh, my name is Sina Farhadi. I'm in 12th grade at Northgate High School. Go Broncos. Uh, and this is my third year on the commission. Uh, my question was, what do you hope to accomplish most during this term or accomplish during this term? As Profty touched on, I was also in the policy subcommittee last year, and I think seeing um, the policy procedures uh, behind the scene was really exciting, and I'm really excited to see that blossom. Uh, also, I'm really excited this year to have more in-person events to kind of incorporate uh, civically engaged and passionate youth into uh, city government and kind of give them the experience we, we almost did in 2020 but failed because of COVID. So I'm really excited for this turn, and I uh, look forward to working with all you in the future. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Sina. Also want to mention, Cena is one of our Walnut Creek heroes for this year. Uh, was nominated or recognized a few months ago. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Alexander Bunnick. I am a sophomore at Contra Costa School of Performing Arts, and this is my second year on the Walnut Creek Youth Commission. Um, as things are opening back up, I'm really excited to be back in person for our events and our meetings after a long year of online. This year, I hope to work more within the arts and sustainability. Thank you to the council for supporting the commission. I appreciate your support. Have a good night. Thanks, Alexander. Uh, hi. So uh, my name is Colin Bosley. I'm a senior at Northgate High School. And uh, this is my second year on the commission. Um, and what I'm most excited about for this term is getting to collaborate with um, the rest of the commission on creative new solutions to problems in the city um, and get the youth involved. Um, we already talked about um, our policy project as well as our piano project and community cleanup um, and the other projects we took on last year. And I'm really excited to get to uh, work on some new creative ones and uh, find some new solutions um, for the new commission so we can get um, the entire youth population of, the Wal of Walnut Creek um, involved. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Colin. Hello, my name is Anika Ramasamy, and I am a junior at Headboy School in Oakland, and this is my first year serving on the commission. So during this pandemic era, COVID recovery is a top priority, and I hope to work toward full public safety and general well-being. I hope to make sustainable change and a real impact in our community for everyone. Ultimately, I'm so excited to be here, and I hope to learn about local government and gain great experience working with this dedicated group of commissioners. So thank you. Thanks, Annika. Hi, my name is Kira Lund and I'm a freshman at Northgate. This is my first year serving on the commission. And the reason why I wanted to serve on the Youth Commission is to really give back to the community that's given so much to me. I've grown up here all my life and I've I'm just really excited to try to help them um, and we can, I think that as a group, 
we can um, we can really work on it together and find little r room for improvement. And I think that um, we're all so brilliant and and smart. So I think that we can really work together to um, to make improvement in our community. Thank you. Thanks, Kira. I am so glad we have brilliant and smart youth commissioners. We need them. <laughs> My name is Isha, and I'm a junior at Monta Vista High School. So I'm really excited to serve on the Youth Commission as it's my first year because I'm really looking forward to working with the other commissioners and being able to make positive change in Walnut Creek and make it a better and safer place to live. And I'm also really interested in learning about our city's government, and being able to be a part of it is really amazing. Thank you. Thanks, Isha. Hi everyone, I'm Ella Copper and I'm a sophomore at Northgate and this is my first year on the commission. This year I'm very excited to collaborate with my fellow commissioners and get to work on some projects for Walnut Creek. And I'm sure this year we can do lots of great things that will have a real impact on our city. And I'm just so happy to be here and grateful to serve on behalf of Walnut Creek Seeds. So thank you. Thank you, Ella. So I'm not Riley, but she couldn't be here today. So she wanted you guys to know that she's excited about learning about local government and bonding with the fellow youth commissioners. And this is her first year on the commission. Where, where does she go? I don't know. Las Lomas, Las Lomas? okay. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I'm Arjun Desange. Uh, this is my second year on the commission. I'm a junior in Northgate. And uh, I applied to the commission last year during COVID because I saw the world like crumbling and I was like, I can do something about this. <laughs> and uh, I, I, really, I really wanted to learn about local government and help out. And I'm, I had a lot of fun last year, so I'm looking forward to this year, too. Great. Thanks, Arjun. Which brings us back to Rebecca. <laughs> Hello again. Uh, my name is Rebecca Joseph, as I said previously. But um, this is my second year on the commission, and I'm also a junior at Los Lomas High School. And I'm really... Um, excited about actually being able to be in person for uh, this for this year for this year's term. As last year, I applied with Arjun, and the majority of the term was spent online. So I'm super excited to be in person. And for what I want to accomplish, I really hope that, as Prop D and Cena mentioned earlier, I was also part of the policy group, and I hope that we can really further that and see um, more youth be able to um, be civically engaged and have more opportunities, just like the 15 of us have. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. And I think that wraps it all up for all the commissioners. Well, thank you all. Uh, we are looking forward to having you here for this year as well. And I welcome all of you. And if any other council members would like to say anything, uh, we're really pleased to have you on board. Great. Thank you. Right. Next, we have a presentation for Arts Around August and giving us a recap of that. And we've got Cara Navaglio. Is Cara on, in person or on Zoom? Cara is joining us on Zoom, so we will be bringing her in. OK. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. I am Karen Navolio. I live in Walnut Creek. And for um, the months of April through September, I worked for Walnut Creek downtown um, as the coordinator of the Arts Around August program. So I'm here tonight just to give you a quick summary of the program. Um, you can change the slide. Uh, the objective of the of the program was um, to bring all of our organizations within the city together um, to create a calendar of events that could bring people downtown to shop and dine and um, hopefully um, support the businesses downtown um, by bringing arts programming downtown 
um, from many, many different organizations. We had 11 different organizations and partners that worked together along with the city and with Walnut Creek downtown. We had media partners and an and event photographer, Jim Fidelibus, and uh, a marketing plan that included uh, print and digital advertising. We had some editorial content, we had banners and social media. So that's sort of an overview of, of what we did. Um, next slide. This is a calendar that showed we, we had something going on every day in the month of August, um, 33 different events and five ongoing programs like the painted pianos that you heard about just a little while ago, um, scavenger hunts, uh, the Bedford Gallery exhibit. And then as you can see each day, there were um, a variety of different things for different ages. We had some things for, for children and families and um, we had walking tours. We had performance, live performances of jazz and opera and uh, bands at Broadway Plaza and also downtown. Okay, next slide. Um, this is the partners that all came together, uh, working together for this for this project. Uh, in addition to the city and Walnut Creek downtown, we had the Lesher Center, the Valley Art Gallery, the Bedford Gallery, DRAA, all of our arts organizations, uh, Broadway Plaza, and um, many downtown businesses also were involved, as well as the Chamber and the Convention and Visitors Bureau. Next slide. So we've, we felt the program was successful. We were, all the partners that were involved were very happy to be part of something that was sort of all encompassing to the, um, to the city rather than just working on their own events. They were happy to be part of this sort of bigger thing that was, um, we were all promoting each other's events and working together and they would like to see it become an annual event. We did have some discussion as to whether August was the best month, just because we had lots of issues this year with, um, with the smoke. And of course, as August hit, we also got the Delta variant um, news um, and that affected events as well. And then we had, um, of course, some hot days, which is typical of August and um, also, the, you know, the school year is getting earlier and earlier, and so we, we do need to look at that next year in terms of when coordinating the, the family events with when school starts. Um, we talked about, you know, next year perhaps linking some of the events together um, with businesses, so a person may, might want to come downtown, not just to go on a walking tour, but maybe walking tour with a coupon for dinner or Cinderella performances with coupons for going out for ice cream and things like that. So those are some things we're thinking about for next year. Um, and um, lastly, um, the program was completed under the $50,000 budget that was allocated by the city. Um, and the next slide shows uh, just a quick summary of the expenses. Um, the pro, we, we allowed $30,000 for, for different programs to use to promote their events um, or for rentals and things like that. And 23,000 was used. Um, marketing publicity, we actually spent um, 12,000, but we, we got income from the banner sponsorships, which reduced that to 6,000. We were, we were overwhelmed with um, 23 of our banners being sponsored by uh, downtown businesses, which, which was not what we expected. So we were, we were so thrilled with that. Um, the businesses were really helping us to support this program. And then the coordination fee. So came in about $10,000 under the budget. Next slide. This is just a, just a quick um, 
showing you of some of the things that we did to promote the program um, with Diablo Magazine and Walnut Creek Magazine. Um, mostly it was digital marketing, digital uh, website ads and newsletters. And then we also had some advertising in some other smaller publications that um, sort of all work together to help you know, increase awareness for our different programs. This uh, particular uh, event uh, showing here on the Diablo Magazine A-list was the Movable Feast, which was very successful uh, program and, and sold out all four weeks. Okay, next slide. And again, just a, uh, just a few visuals on some of the coverage that we got. This on the left is um, the Walnut Creek Magazine weekly newsletter and website um, helped you know, reach all of their followers. And then an example of a, um, our print ad that went in several places. Next slide. And then a big part of it was our, was our social media um, Instagram and Facebook, and then each of our partners also had their own social media accounts. And so between their accounts and ours, uh, we were able to get lots of, um, lots of mentions. Our social media person created this graphic that kind of gave a consistent look throughout all of the programs um, with our logo and a similar style of, of promoting these events. And then we also got some great shout out from the Walnut Creek, um, Walnut Creek Gov Instagram and the July mayor's update. Next slide. This just shows the banners that we were able to uh, put out there. We on the left are the ones that were um, at three of the city parks. And on the right are the ones that hung on the lamppost banners downtown. Those are the ones that were sponsored by the downtown businesses. And uh, they went for five weeks throughout um, the city. So the end of July, last week of July through the end of August, um, again, helping to bring awareness. And as we go into you know, future years, we hope that more and more people will recognize our logo and our and our message. Okay, next slide. So just to you know, just to finalize um, some of the challenges that we that we found, um, we had um, two movies on the roof events that both had to be canceled because of issues going on in August. One was a very bad smoke night, and one was a high wind. So um, we'll have to consider, you know, whether that's a, um, an appropriate event for August in the future. And then our scavenger hunt only had one entry despite um, over a hundred visits to the webpage. So again, we'll be looking at that. Walking tours were also not highly attended and we'll look at how we can um, maybe do some synergy with other programs or, or businesses to get that better. And um, yeah, just working, all of our partners were very interested in helping to promote each other's events more so um, next year than, than happened this year. Um, the highlights were that um, the concerts at Broadway Plaza and the first Wednesdays were very well attended with over a thousand people at each one. Um, so that was six different events, four, four Broadway Plaza concerts and two first Wednesdays. As I mentioned before, the Movable Feast uh, sold out all four weeks, um, had great feedback from all of the attendees and the restaurants as well. Um, really enjoyed being part of something like this in the city. And then we had Paint the Downtown, which was a, um, a plein air art festival. And they had a great turnout on the last day where they had their show at the plaza at Lesher Center. Um, brought a lot, a lot of people downtown. Um, farmer's market was also going on. So there was a lot of uh, extra foot traffic from that. And then um, taking into account the hurdles that we had with the weather and the COVID and um, the Delta issue, um, all of 
uh, many of our events were very well attended and the organizations were really happy, especially some of those things that were happening for the first time um, since COVID started. You know, we hadn't had an event at the Lesher Center in over a year. So um, getting people back in there for the festival opera performances and then getting people um, out on the plaza as well um, for the Cinderella performance and the jazz concert it was is a nice way to sort of say that the arts are back in Walnut Creek. So that is the conclusion of my presentation. Great, thank you, Kara. The arts are back. Walnut Creek's back. Walnut Creek's open yes. for business. Uh, <laughs> yes. Do we have any any council member questions for Kara? Well, for me personally speaking, I was I love seeing this around August. August typically not a lot happens in Walnut Creek, and so while we can never predict what the weather and smoke or rain, hopefully rain, <laughs> can, will ever bring, <laughs> uh, I, I thought it was terrific. And thank you for all you did. And, and can I add that this was our first year and was a remarkable success because um, of all the challenges and it was our first year. Um, I bet there are some more really good ideas out there. And if you think that you have an idea for something that could be arts in Walnut Creek in August, um, please report it either to me or to um, somebody at downtown Walnut Creek or somebody at the chamber. And we'll see if we can work your idea in, and you can, we might even figure out a way to give you special credit. <laughs> Great. Great idea. So th thanks again, Kara. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Next on the agenda is the consent calendar. Does any council member wish to pull an item for discussion? Does any member of the public wish to comment on an item on the consent calendar? Please use the raised hand feature or press star nine if you're connected by audio only, if you would like to provide a public comment. For those who desire to provide a public comment on a consent calendar item only, only please raise your hand now. As a reminder, each speaker will have two minutes to make their oral remarks. The Zoom feed for each speaker will cut off automatically at two minutes. Written comments submitted have been and will be posted to the city's website in public, for public review and are included in the meeting record but will not be separately read into the record. At this time, I'll ask the city clerk if there are any members of the public who would like to provide comments on the consent calendar. We'll go, not on consent calendar here? Okay. Any, no, what, yeah. So this is, this is consent calendar. Okay. Uh, and do we have any, any, any Zoom? We have no speakers on Zoom. Okay. So actually, so, he, so he, you actually do want to speak on the consent calendar, Mr. Bennett? What? You actually do want to speak on the consent calendar on item, on item um, 2D. 2D is the robot program. The robot program. Hey, everybody. My name is Pete Bennett. Um, I'm a bombing victim. We're about to talk about a robot. My truck exploded on the freeway 16 year, 18 years ago with me inside. I'm a little frustrated with the Walnut Creek Bomb Squad. It goes back 40 years. The Bomb Squad was trained by FBI agent Frank Doyle Jr. The same FBI agent, for those of you that remember the Judy Berry bombing. It's not funny at all, Luella. My family got killed. I hate that when you laugh at my stuff. I do. I really do. I have five family members killed in Utah. Five. I know the American killed in Barcelona in a terrorist attack. I'm a bombing victim. My truck exploded. I'm part of the PG&E explosion. And 35 years ago, I sued the people that blew up the pipeline down the street. Now, I've gone through machinations for how many years I've been speaking here? 10? And instead, I end up in the hospital with broken bones and broken fingers and all kinds of stuff and get fake phone calls all day long. No remedy, so don't give him a toy. Because the guy sitting behind me, if it's that's David back there, I think that's David Livingston, uh, maybe not. You know, nobody's, had, nobody's ever come up with any proof whatsoever. In the last attack that I went through, I suffered a stroke. I collapsed in the hospital. Did you guys offer me a ride be between here? I slept out here, you took all my property. How much more homeless do you need from me? How much more of my assets do you want to steal? Because I have a million dollar loss with a trust. 
with an attorney that defrauded my family. And I know Benny Jacuti, and I know all the guys from CNET, and I know all these people. And last summer, I finally got an attorney willing to take my case, and they shot him dead. That's what's going on in my life. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Do we have any other members of the public that would like to speak on a consent calendar item? All right, we'll now close that portion. And if we have a motion or... I, I move that we approve the consent calendar A through E, and E is as amended. Second. We have a motion and a second. City Clerk, could you please read the roll? Councilmember Haskew. Aye. Councilmember Silva. Aye. Councilmember Darling. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Francois. Aye. And Mayor Wilk. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Okay. All right, th now we come to public communications. This portion of the meeting is reserved for comments on items not on the agenda. Under the Brown Act, the Council cannot act on items raised during public communications, but may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed, request clarification, or refer the item to staff. Consistent with Section 9.5 of the City Council Handbook, 30 minutes will be allocated at this time for public communications for items not on the agenda. Additional time for public communications for items not on the agenda will be provided at the end of the meeting if necessary. Does any member of the public wish to provide public comments at this time? Please use the raised hand feature or press star 9 if you're connected by audio only if you'd like to provide a public comment. For those who desire to provide public comment on an item not on the agenda, please raise your hand now so that we can identify the total number of speakers that desire to speak at this time. As a reminder, each speaker will have two minutes to make their oral remarks. Hold on, hold on on the, uh, on the lining up, and I'll get to that in, in just a second. The Zoom feed for each speaker will cut off automatically at two minutes. Written comments submitted have been posted to the city's website for public review and are included in the meeting record but will not separately be read into the record. Okay, so for people that are here in person, please line up against the wall. Give yourself a few feet up from each other. You can wind around farther just to give some social distancing while we're, while we're still social distancing. And at this time, I will note that the time is 6.43, and we'll take public comments on items not on the agenda until approximately 7.13, and then the remainder of any such comments at the end of the open session portion of the meeting. If you, if you hear the buzzer go off at two minutes, please finish that sentence, and you also don't have to take the full two minutes. If you agree with the speaker that just spoke, you can say, I agree with them as well, state your name and city, and, and we'll get that down as well. So at this po time, we'll call the first speaker here. And if you want to come up, state your name and city. Good evening, council members. I'm Linda from San Ramon. I've been praying in front of the abortion facility in Walnut Creek since 2016. There is a great sense of joy and peace in the hearts of the volunteers who pray with us. We all have a deep desire to reach out to those who are suffering and to defend the vulnerable little ones in the womb. We peacefully gather to pray and to offer hope and healing through the numerous resources we can offer the women and men in unplanned pregnancies. Over the years, we have witnessed several abortion-bound women change their minds and choose life. We had the pleasure of helping one mother pregnant with twins a few years ago. Our volunteers were able to meet and hold her precious babies and shower them with gifts and we continue to support her in various ways even to this day. She sends pictures and updates of her and her children are gorgeous, well taken care of and happy. Although life is certainly not easy for this young mother, she has told me many times that she feels so blessed to have her children. Our presence, however, may be threatening to the abortion providers on Oakland Boulevard because we have witnessed some disturbing scenes. Ambulances picking up women on three occasions since May of this year. May 14th, a 20-year-old woman suffered uncontrolled pain and kept bleeding after her abortion. One week later, on May 21st, a 21-year-old woman unconscious and unresponsive after an abortion. July 23rd, a 29-year-old woman had uncontrolled hemorrhaging after a uterine aspiration abortion. We were not only there to witness 
but we were there to pray for the physical and emotional well-being of the mother who lost her child and the abortion workers inside. Our mission is simply love, and love does not need a buffer zone. Thank you. Okay. I would, again, this is a business meeting. I would like everybody to please uh, refrain from clapping for any speaker, wh whether you're for or against them, because that can also uh, change the way pe speakers would be speaking, and we want this to be an open forum. So please refrain yourselves during this business meeting. Thank you. Good evening. Hard to speak with this mask tonight. Uh, Jan Warren, 36-year resident of Walnut Creek. Um, I'm happy to be here, not as excited as the kids, though. But nice, I love the pianos. Uh, I spoke here two weeks ago uh, about the need for a local anti-harassment uh, ordinance. First of all, we worked well together for many years to provide affordable housing in Walnut Creek. And there's also something called housing that's affordable. The tenants who spoke last time lived in such housing for 10 years. Then the complex was sold. They were given an, an eviction notice the next month. Time out. <laughs> this was given to all the tenants' units under the guise of major necessary repairs. The improvements were not due to any health or safety code violation. The new owner uh, wanted to upgrade to increase rents. People need safe homes. They don't necessarily need granite counters to live safely. There is a loophole in the state law that could be fixed with an ordinance that said if you have to move out for 30 days for necessary repairs due to health code, you can move back at, in at the same rent. Tenants weren't being evicted because they hadn't paid their rent. They were up to date. I first heard about this in July, and I reached out to Margot Ernst and wasn't able to connect with her, so I reached out to Kara Batista Rao. She told me the city financially supported Eden Council for hope and opportunity to provide tenant and landlord services. A group of us have met with the mayor, and a group has met with Margot. We've had uh, uh, just the ask tonight is uh, the subcommittee on housing and economic development was recently canceled and hadn't met for a while. So please tell me when uh, we can meet and have a discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. My name is Jane. I'm from Walnut Creek. <coughs> we at 40 Days for Life in Walnut Creek have been assembling peacefully for several years praying on the sidewalk in front of Planned Parenthood. We pray that the women and men who approach Planned Parenthood will change their hearts and minds and decide not to abort their baby. We have pertinent and helpful information that will support these young couples. We will walk with them throughout their pregnancy and after the birth of their baby. We network with resources and organizations which provide temporary housing, counseling, baby furniture, baby clothes, diapers, job referrals, adoption information, free pregnancy tests, and ultrasound. We do not intimidate or harass these couples, but peacefully engage them in conversation if they are open to it. Many passers-by show their support for us as they drive by while we are praying. We are not doing anything illegal, and we have a constitutional right to free speech. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening. I'm here to respond to the false accusations levied towards our sidewalk advocates two weeks ago. Could you please uh, state your name and uh, Don, uh, Don Blythe from Stockton. Thank you. I believe the motivation of Planned Parenthood's attempt to secure a buffer zone is found in their observation of the sidewalk advocates' success outside their center on the public sidewalk. Every time a woman changes her mind and doesn't abort her child, Planned Parenthood loses a lot of money. Every time our advocates successfully warn the clients about the increased number of ambulances taking away injured women from the Walnut Creek Planned Parenthood, the Planned Parenthood staff get nervous. Every time the advocates inform the clients that the abortion procedure is the only surgery in California that no longer requires a licensed doctor, 
the Planned Parenthood staff get irritated. Every time our sidewalk advocates are approached by a woman or couple who come out of the Planned Parenthood to tell us about a questionable tactic employed by an aggressive Planned Parenthood staff, the Planned Parenthood staff get worried. Every time the police are called by Planned Parenthood only to find that the staff had misled the police with a false report, the staff are bothered. Every time the Planned Parenthood staff see their volunteer escorts cross the line, pushing, harassing, or cursing the advocates out on the public sidewalk, they get uncomfortable. If the City Council allows the Walnut Creek Planned Parenthood to motivate you in the wrong direction with an unnecessary buffer zone, the result will be less informed clients, more aborted boys and girls, and more wounded women taken away in ambulances. Next speaker. Good evening, Council. My name is Carol Faust, and I reside in Concord, California. For the past five or six years, I have joined other pro-life counselors that have been peacefully standing and praying and sharing options with those planning or contemplating terminating their pregnancy. Over the years, the police have been called a few times and not once has any sidewalk counselor been cited or reprimanded. We have violated no law. However, we have been personally yelled at, flipped off, and witnessed one young man shoved off the sidewalk into the street another threatened with physical violence, and another doused with hot coffee. We, however, continue to stand peacefully and prayerfully committed to being a voice for the voiceless, oppose the shedding of innocent blood, and give women the information and help needed to make informed decisions. Several times it is the distraught fathers opposed to abortion that we have spoken and prayed with and given information about post-abortion counseling. Many of the women on the sidewalk praying and counseling with us have had abortions in the past and personally experienced some of the consequences emotionally, physically, psychologically, and spiritually. It is our care and concern for these women and the child that they carry that brings us to the sidewalk. We have witnessed ambulances called and women on stretchers being carried away on multiple occasions just these past five months. We believe that taking human life has consequences that many would avoid if given the information and options that are offered. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, my name's Pete Bennett again. Uh, my blog is uh, PeteBennett.net. It's not a very good starting point, but um, you type my name in, you'll find out I've got about 3,000 pages posted on the Internet, and I talk about a lot of things that have gone on. And I'm a little tired of the tragedies. You know, I spoke here on November 2nd, 2011, about three months after my car was deliberately totaled in Lafayette. Okay? I run a blog... Scott Peterson is innocent.com, and I'm going to show you something you don't know about. Because the people that put my car into oncoming traffic are connected to that case. Unfortunate. And that's when I was working for PG&E. And when I was working for PG&E, somebody seeded my laptop with 25,000 plus or minus pages. I think it's around 20 to 25,000. And those pages are in the wild. And those pages are so dangerous. You think your explosion down the street's bad? The maps that were stolen from me pretty much match half the fires in Northern California. And over at PG&E, I don't exist. And over at the city of San Bruno, I don't exist. And over the FBI, but I worked for them. I have the documents, but they were stolen when you arrested me. These are critical infrastructure paperwork. And PG&E, my customer was just indicted two weeks ago. Autonomic software provides the Windows Update servers for hundreds of facilities. 
perfect candidate for stealing the documents off the uh, server and giving them to me. And I'm tired of being part of, part of this conspiracy. Because people have been, could you please? Thank you. And, uh, you know, my turn. So how about it? Somebody tell me how I got involved in a gas pipeline explosion in San Bruno and the one here in Walnut Creek where my girlfriend was murdered with her daughter. It's time Thank you. to turn the tables my direction. Thank you, Pete. And actually give me my money that you've stolen. It's a lot. It's two million. Good evening, Council. I'm Catherine Wally, resident of Walnut Creek. Thank you again for the September 21st updates on work being done in furtherance of the Council priorities for the 21-22 calendar years. At the same meeting, Council Member Darling spoke movingly about climate change and her experience driving through the fire scar created by the Dixie Fire. It was because of this that I was also surprised to learn that the city's legislative committee met with the city's lobbyist in Sacramento to take a formal opposed position to SB 9. Well, certainly not a panacea. SB 9 has a potential to shift underlying mechanisms in such a way that will bolster work being done on most of our city's priorities. Exclusionary zoning is a driver of inequity and segregation, effectively building walls around cities like Walnut Creek that house wealthier Californians, while simultaneously exacerbating the concentration of poverty on the other side of these walls, which compounds conditions known to harm social well-being and increase crime. Exclusionary zoning contributes to the housing crisis and homelessness, dampens our city's ability to thrive and adapt, increases commutes, sprawl, and building in the WUI, which in turn advance climate change, making fire seasons worse for all of us, and intensifying the state's water crisis, as Mayor Wilk attested to at the October 5th meeting. We must reckon with the fact that Walnut Creek has long participated in supporting mechanisms that contribute to the many, of the many of the problems that we now seek to address with our city's priorities. As such, we have a responsibility to embrace um, opportunities to counter harmful systems and cease using our city's resources and political capital to actively lobby against legislation that creates positive structural change. We can use our power for changes that are in the interests of our city recognizing that the interests of Walnut Creek are inextricably tied to the well-being of our county, our state, our nation, and our world. Thank you so much for your time and your service. Thank you, Catherine. I, uh, my name's Michael Wildman. I'm from Concord, California. <laughs> Don't mind me, I'm a little nervous. First time, I, I respect all of you. I think you're great. Thank you for the police. God bless them. I just want to say I, I stand with Lighthouse Baptist Church and my pastor. I just started helping the uh, abort the Planned Parenthood, the church, uh, help those women, those young ladies, try and save their babies. I, I don't, we're going to take several persecution, a lot of persecution for Jesus Christ, but I want to represent my God, my Lord, my Savior. We're supposed to preach a gospel. We have that right. We try and help people. I've never seen any hostility out there. But uh, I just, I have a joy in my heart to help others, to help the young ladies, the young women save their babies. And we can make that difference uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ on our side. And he's with us all the time. And we need to realize that. And... I just, I just want to say, it. I've never seen any hostility. I've never witnessed anything. I just started three months ago, and I think it's a great thing to be out there to preach the gospel for Jesus Christ, and to stand for Him in these last days. Because one day we're going to give an account before Jesus Christ, and it's not going to be here. It's going to be in heaven, and I just hope everybody repents and turns to Jesus Christ as their Savior. Next speaker. Good evening, council members and, and community and young students. My name is Sergio from Martinez, born and raised 65 years in this county. I've lived all my life, and in this county as well as Walnut Creek, 
family members and friends that have lived here as well as in Walla Creek. Key points that were made by the students. Without them, we would not have our life to come and continue to live. Youth, you want to bring them up. We want to save lives. We want to be that consistent counseling for these sidewalk women that come by and support them two weeks ago. We, in particular, me, myself, stopped and saved a life. Today, we had two saves, and I am there for that. I am there to pray and continue to save, and that choice, we give them that choice. We have prayed for them. We supported and continue to support these women that are out there and need the support. There's so much that we can do, as well as all of you. The whole community here can help but we don't want to see dead babies. You guys are all living. Every single one of you are alive. And you know what? God blessed you all to be alive. That is why you are here. We are all witnesses, witnesses to life. And that's what we are here for, to witness and save lives. That's what God wants us for. We live for Jesus, and that's what I am here for. I will not give up my life without saving more babies. And if it is that I stand there and take more of these helpful people to help with me to bring more life to this world, I will. Like these young students, life-giving, giving, thanksgiving, youth to continue on and bringing up this world as God wants it to be in no other way without Jesus. And I hope you all understand because that judgment will come with all of us. Amen. Next speaker. Good evening, honorable magistrates. My name is Sophia, and I'm from Brentwood, California. Uh, 25 years ago, I found myself at the Planned Parenthood Clinic in Walnut Creek. I was in a relationship, but was also a victim of a sexual crime by an older man, well over 18. I was a minor, only 15 years of age. However, when I sought an abortion, there was no detailed inquiry into the nature of my pregnancy, nor did the staff do anything to protect me against the crime that had been committed. When I received my abortion that day, the procedure was done incorrectly. I began hemorrhaging and needed to go in for a second time to have the abortion completed. I never once stepped foot in that clinic again. Following this event in my life, such turmoil began, years of shame and regret. I wish that I had responded to someone like me standing outside of the clinic that day. We are not there to shame women, but to remind them of the immense love of Jesus Christ, the reality that the sin of abortion will bring more heartache than they could ever imagine, and that God, the true God of heaven and earth, will forgive. We are there to provide tangible help to these mamas through the local church, whether it be a place to stay, a ride to the Pregnancy Resource Center to hear their baby's heartbeat, help with financial needs, and much more. We are there for the long haul to walk them through their brokenness. Will Planned Parenthood be? No. I have researched buffer zones, and as you know, they are a violation of our First Amendment rights. I have sought legal counsel, and if implemented in this city, I want you to know that I will hold you accountable to the highest courts in the land. Thank you very much for your time, and may God grant you favor to respond in a manner which is pleasing in his sight. Good evening, council members. My name is Richard. I'm from Concord. Um, I'm an advocate for pro-life on the streets in front of uh, Planned Parenthood. A couple of weeks ago, the workers and escorts from Planned Parenthood painted a picture of um, things out of control. And things are not out of control. We have um, great respect for the people that pass by on the sidewalks to the women that go in. We do try to uh, convince them that um, they can. there's an option. They don't have to have an abortion. When somebody is walking our way, we, we move out of the way so they can walk on the sidewalk. But um, Planned Parenthood said that we're forcing them on the street and making it unsafe. The ones that go on the street do that on their own. 
They walk around. Some are runners. They're running by. The aggressiveness has been against us. We aren't aggressive. I've been punched out, knocked to the ground. Sergio, who was here just uh, two people ago, uh, we were both uh, knocked out by this fellow who um, attacked us. And I've seen that. We haven't attacked anybody going in, anybody that works there, but we have. We've been attacked. So the safety issue and the aggressiveness is not from us. It's not, it's not, on, um, it's not where they're, what we're there for. We're there to save lives. Thank you. Next speaker. My name is James Cook. I'm from Antioch. I'm also a pastor in Concord. Me and my family have been down there for about a year now, pleading for life. I've never done this before, before then. I didn't know what to do. I went down there and saw the atrocity that goes on in your city. The atrocity that goes on in your city. I looked up your statistics in this city for this year. You don't report those as homicides down there. When a beating heart of a human being loses their life, premeditated, child molestation, ripping their arms and legs off through a tube, that is called murder. It should be recorded as a murder. And if you fund or you, Planned Parenthood is funded by my money, they should report all of the deaths that they do every year. It should be posted on your city. Planned Parenthood is in this city. This is how many murders that we're okay with. I doubt that you guys even knew how many ambulance rides that they took this, this year. How many women have been hurt down there? I doubt that you have took the time to do that. I will say this. Me and my family have been assaulted more by their employees. My son was shoved and pushed. Policemen said that that's an assault. What did they do? Nothing. Today, one of their employees comes and turns their Suburban on. For an hour and a half, we had to suck that exhaust. I called 911. No officer came for an hour and a half. I want to know what happened. You guys zoomed in and said, we want to thank you for your partnership with the CEO. I want to know what your partnership is with that place. Next speaker. Hi, I'm Teresa from Danville, and um, I go to the sidewalk um, by Planned Parenthood, and I pray. I pray for the mother. I pray for the father. I pray for the unborn baby, and I pray for even pray for the workers at Planned Parenthood. And I, I don't think that needs a buffer. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lori Lenahan Wadelick, and I um, live in Danville. I'm also one of the prayer moms that come out to the sidewalk, and we are only on the sidewalk. We never accost anyone. All we do is pray. Just like Teresa said, we love these women. We love their babies. We love their families. We pray for the people that are in the Planned Parenthood. And we're very calm. We say the rosary. And we've never accosted anybody. And that's it. That we just, I just wanted to give a clear picture because of what supposedly was said before. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good evening. My name is Margie. I'm from Dublin. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Um, in the past year, I have been praying in, in with this group of pro-lifers at the Walnut Creek Planned Parenthood. Our only interest is providing love and support for these women and for their children. I have not witnessed any hostility or any aggressions by anybody on our team. In the past year, I have witnessed three occasions when an ambulance came to take women to the hospital. 
it is very upsetting and alarming to see this occur with some frequency. We stand and pray for the survival of the woman and her return to good health. I have listened to a woman who cried hysterically because she had a botched abortion and she could never have another baby. I've also had the experience of meeting a young man whose mother saw the pro-life advocates outside, had a change of heart, and decided not to abort her baby. This young man is incredible. This is why we need to be there to provide love and support where it is desperately needed. On another occasion, I witnessed two women who came out with glazed looks in their eyes. They were unaccompanied by Planned Parenthood escorts. We offered to stay with them until they felt well enough to go to their cars or their Uber drivers because that's how many of them get picked up. Finally, in the notes that were given by the previous Planned Parenthood meeting, volunteers that were here, one of the volunteers mentioned that traffic issues were caused by us. That is not the case. There was a car accident two months ago, and I was there when the driver said that he was speeding and did not realize the curve. We watched cars speed by daily in excess of the speed limits, and sometimes they will pass on the oncoming traffic to get around slower drivers. If Planned Parenthood wants to ask a buffer, Thank you. a buffer zone, I think they would be better served to the community to ask for a traffic study. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. All right, looks like we've come to the end of the line on the in-person speakers. We have about two minutes to go, and we've got two speakers on Zoom. So let's bring those speakers in. We'll start with uh, the first speaker, and then if, that's, if all we have is the two, maybe we'll just finish off public comment at that point with those two. Gregory Beckner. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Just a second. Let me get on, on camera. If you're with you and God bless, I'm here to uh, give my testimony on my experiences at uh, the Planned Parenthood Clinic where we do our pro-life vigils. And I'd just like to describe uh, from our testimony that I've seen from my own eyes, uh, a testimony of complete peace and support for the women that come in and out of there so that they make the best decisions that we feel is possible for them to make for that is what's best for their spiritual and their emotional and their physical health. Uh, I like to say that we use nonviolence at, at all costs and that in, in 40 Days for Life, for anybody that joins this movement uh, for health for the women, is that we sign an agreement of peace for anybody that joins in with our cause for life. I give the testimony that there have been babies saved, and I'm very happy to hear that. And that the number one priority is for the woman's health, but also from my own testimony, I pray for the individuals in the clinics, the workers, uh, that all of us uh, can be uh, together and not as enemies of one another, but peacefully coexist with one another uh, and with relative love and respect for e towards each other's agendas. I would like to see more baby saved, but at the same time, I would like to um, see, uh, uh, see us be able to um, have our cause with, a, with a, a, a full amount of cooperation from the people of Walnut Creek. And that there have been times when the police have been called, but we have done nothing wrong. When I've seen, uh, it's been a peaceful coexistence and I'd like to keep it that way without the buffer zone. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Susie, why don't we bring in our final speaker and then we'll be closing public comment after that. Okay, next speaker is, and final speaker is BG. Hello, uh, my name is Barbara Guinness and I've, uh, been a uh, resident of Walnut Creek since 1996. 
I just wanted to take just a few seconds today to thank the mayor and Councilwoman uh, Silva, who both met with me on different dates, the mayor on September 26th and uh, Councilman Silva, Silva on October 10th. And this where I met with them was at the Walnut Creek downtown farmer's market. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to listen to my concerns, primarily about the open space and keeping it and you know, uh, conserving it and preserving it and also preventing the bike flow trail. I think it's a great opportunity for residents to meet some of the council people or maybe even the mayor face to face. So I just wanted to say thank you very much. I appreciated you both taking the time to listen to my concerns. And if there'll be other council members or maybe the mayor again at a future mar uh, farmer's market, I may have a chance to meet you. So thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara. You're welcome. We're at the farmer's market every Sunday from 10 to 12. Holidays. Except for holidays and rainy days <laughs> and windy days, two windy days. All right, we're going to be closing public comment now. And I would like to ask if any council members have any questions or comments related to anything that we heard during our public comments, either of staff or of um, anybody else. There was one question from Jan Warren about when the next housing uh, committee was going to be, and I don't know if we saw something today, and I don't know if we, this month got canceled. But. Yeah, the standing uh, housing and community development meeting for the city was canceled, uh, the most recent one. It's, it's scheduled, I believe, monthly or every other month, but only if there are active agenda items. Thank you. Right. So, th and that's put out to the community when there is something that's scheduled then for that? Okay. And uh, I wanted to ask a question that Catherine Wally had brought up, and if I can ask either the city manager or city attorney regarding SB9 and the status of that. Uh, SB9 was um, approved by the legislature, signed by the governor. It takes effect uh, January 1st. Uh, we are working with staff to bring forward to the city council a presentation regarding SB9, and we'll be doing that um, in November. November is the Great. timeline right there. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. Can I ask a question about that? Because I don't think we opposed SB 9 on the basis of wanting to have exclusionary zoning. I think it was on a matter of being able to determine at the local level how we would approach um, zoning such as that. that. That's a good distinction. Um, and, and that's been consistent with city council's directive, which is to uh, want local control over the ability of being able to zone our own city. A and set up the, the standards whereby, based on what, what's happening in different neighborhoods and different that, that, streets. That is correct. The council has taken a, a, a position that um, supports the historical local control that exists with land use decisions, and the council has also been very active in promoting affordable housing, ADUs, and other forms of housing opportunities. Um, SB 9 does preempt local authority on, on two fronts, and it is on those issues that we would be reporting back to the council at your meeting in November. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Okay. Uh, next is council member and staff announcements, reports on activities or requests. And who would like to start? Like council member Darling, all right. Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe we want to start with city manager. <laughs> city oh. I see Cindy waving at me. <laughs> Got my attention. So why don't we... <laughs> let's start with uh, <laughs> closed session announcements. Uh, thank you, um, Mayor. There were no closed session. There was no closed session this evening. Therefore, we have no closed session announcements. All right, city manager report. Since you're all so excited to get going, I'll keep it brief. No comments this evening. <laughs> okay, well, now you're going to city <laughs> council member Darling. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you said council. You said council. So, um, just two things. Um, the Marine Clean Energy Board had a board retreat this month, and the best part of that was the afternoon session where they brought in a number of speakers who are working on innovative approaches to um, converting organics into either energy or into hydrogen as a transportation mm -hmm. fuel. And uh, based on those two presentations and the other things I've started to see go on in the community, I think um, we're going to be in a good place. There's a lot of great minds from Stanford and other universities trying to figure that out. And that will also be useful 
for the uh, need to divert organics going to landfills. That'll be really interesting to see how it all works out. Um, the other thing is the Walnut Creek Homeless Task Force met this month. We had a good presentation from uh, Walnut Creek downtown and the Chamber of Commerce. They had done a survey of their um, members to find out how they were being impacted by the homeless. And um, they, they um, came up with some interesting findings. We've asked them to reach out to some of their members that are being most impacted by the, the homeless population and make sure we get the core team in there so that those businesses know who to call if they're having problems. You know, we've got the 211 message out there, but the, the, new two, the two new core members are really um, trying to work hard and find everybody and make sure everybody's got services. Um, the homeless, there is a community forum coming up on November 17th. It will be led off by the mayor, 6.30 on Zoom, and it'll be focusing on the mental health services to the homeless. And so the, the task force is working to put that together. And then the last thing, I switched back to MCE, is they do have an annual award that goes to a group that is um, advocating for clean energy. And Rossmore, a sustainable Rossmore has won it in past years. If anybody has any local groups that you know of that are working on sustainable energy um, and forwarding MCEs, talk to me and we can put together a nomination for somebody in the city. And that's my report. Thank you, Cindy. Councilmember Haskew. Thank you very much. Um, we, <coughs> there is kind of a theme in all of this. Um, Contra Costa Mayor's Conference had a speaker from All Homes um, Regional Impact Council, and uh, what he spoke about was um, how to effectively and as inexpensively as possible reduce it, the expense to reach the goal of of uh, saving 75%, causing 75% less homelessness. Um, it was an interesting presentation and uh, I'm sure it's available and their website is uh, amazing. We had community service day on Saturday. I stood by Whole Foods. I'm sure almost everyone, if not everyone was there. Um, the arm twisting wasn't too painful this year. Um, we had uh, our we had uh, lots of good things, and I'm sure the chair will be happy to give us the full and formal result. At Transpac, we had a presentation by an MTC employee about their electric power for powerfication. Um, I just made up that word about getting <laughs> um, electronic uh, power um, cars, automobiles, so that electric cars are more practical. And it was it was full of good information. Uh, we also reviewed a, a project, potential project, about redoing the Monument Corridor, the West Monument part um, under the freeway, um, and it had some pretty interesting ideas. And I, as, a side, as an aside, was appointed the TransPAC representative to the Accessible Transportation Strategy Task Force. Um, let's see. We were at a window ribbon opening for the Third Culture Bakery. Um, there was an amazing pave the way reception for those people who made uh, donations to buy a paver in um, the plaza at Rudley Plaza. And there are still a hundred possibilities. So if your desire is to have your name, if it's not up on lights, at least it's on theater property. That's your chance to take part of it. Um, I went to the DRAA board uh, yesterday. Um, they were all aglow with the uh, effectiveness of the on Broadway and how well it used the plaza and what a lovely night we had. But they also discussed what they how to capitalize on what happened around Tyler Gordon, that amazing young man who did in 15 minutes, some ridiculously small amount of time a picture of Maya, Maya Angelou from a, on a blank canvas that was sold to somebody to whom Maya Angelou was a special personal person um, for $21,000, and that's too good to do. And they also reported on the uh, consultant's report. It's wending its way through and will go 
um, be aired in November and December. And amazingly to, uh, to me, I had a request to reinstate my traffic safety mottos um, that I did in, it turns out, 2016. So I went back and I dug out my safety rules. And today I'm going to focus on drivers. And part of this is because I think that outside, people are forgetting we're not owners of the road like we were when COVID was an example. So let me kind of say the two things that I would like to start with, and I'm warning you, this will be for every council meeting until the end of the year. Uh, the first one is um, uh, don't drive distracted. Um, that includes things like changing radio stations while you're not concentrating on the road, setting up your GPS system so that you can find out where you're going for the next best cocktail and or school, talking to your passengers, including disciplining your kids or making eyes at the person that you really want to spend the rest of your life with. Your job as a driver is to drive with your focus on the road. The second one is I have noticed walking up and down, it's not a safety rule at all, it's just good common manners. Um, there has been a lot of rude driving and by rude driving I mean people revving a, a motors by restaurants and trying to get diners attention driving down with the, lo air, the noise coming out of your radios so that people who are walking across, rocking on, on the sidewalks and who are eating or, or having some kind of recreational evening can only hear the music that you choose to play. It may not be their favorites and you have annoyed them and, and it's all because you want more attention than maybe you should have because maybe you should be paying attention to the road. That's it for tonight, but there's more to come. Thank you, Luella. Uh, let's go to Mayor Pro Tem Francois. Thank you, Mayor. I also attended Community Service Day on October 9th, and I was at Heather Farm with the landscaping spruce up. I gained a wider appreciation for our public works staff than I already had. I see our public works director is here with, uh, we didn't have the benefit of any mechanical tools, so just with our hands, uh, rakes and shovels, myself and a group of maybe 30 or 35 of my fellow residents were able to apply land cover to large portions of uh, Heather Farm, kind of on the periphery around uh, Ballfield One. And uh, light hands make easy work. That was definitely the case there, and so it was a pleasure to, to serve and with a lot of people that were out that day. My wife and I attended the Music for Mental Health fundraiser, benefiting the Las Lomas Wellness Center this last weekend, and that was a fun event. A good turnout, and for a very good cause, uh, of the center at Las Lomas that's helping with mental health, health issues with uh, our high school students. And then last but not least, I also had the pleasure of attending the Las Lomas Homecoming Rally, which was held downtown. Thanks to some of the parent uh, advisors, I have some pictures to share here. Of uh, For those of you who are not familiar with our high school, or at least Las Lomas' high school homecoming, I think it's similar at, at Northgate. Generally, all, the, all this takes place on the high school campus during the day when the parents and the public don't get the benefit of seeing any of this. And this year, the parent advisors for the, the, uh, the homecoming rally decided, let's bring this downtown to Cypress Street and in partnership with the city and Walnut Creek downtown, we're able to put on a very successful and fun event. Uh, so we got to see the floats that each of the classes presented I think that's a picture of the senior class there. Each class had had done, uh, there's a series of floats here. There's all of them depicted. The seniors theme was circus. You can guess some of the other ones. The, the Cafe du Lomas <laughs> was the Mardi Gras theme of the freshmen, which I thought was very clever. 
uh, the next one with the volcano that actually erupted <laughs> was the sophomore class, and it was a their theme was snacks, so they got a little creative that with that. The volcano was supposed to tie into Dole Whip or something, and Dole but it, it was cool to see it erupt. The juniors were uh, then had Hollywood and and movies. Um, there's one more picture if you can show it, Amy. Uh, down on the right there, thanks to Walnut Creek downtown and and the Los Lomas boosters, they had future night shirts mm. printed out, and so for a lot of middle school and younger students, they got one of those shirts. And then in addition to the floats, you can see each class puts on a dance routine, which they call mock rock. Mm -hmm. So it was, a, it was a real fun event. And, and for the council and staff, it was a good example to me of how not even a, a permanent closure, but a, a temporary street closure for one afternoon can bring the community together and, and help out our businesses and restaurants in a very positive way. So I want to thank uh, the Las Lomas Parent Advisors, uh, Marissa Yamamoto and Jenny Cropo for suggesting the idea and really bringing it home, as well as uh, Walnut Creek downtown staff, Kathy Hemingway, and our terrific city staff, uh, Terry Kilgore, Steve Waymeyer, and Don Murphy for bringing this home. And last but not least, Amy Hevener for putting together this PowerPoint, and I found out that she loves doing PowerPoint, so that's... Oh, good news. Yes. That's not, that's not an invitation to ask every week. Well, no, not every week, but I'm going to remember <laughs> that, and you should too. Who's mayor next year? <laughs> we haven't decided yet, but... <laughs> yes, okay, well, thank you, and that's my report. All right, thank you, Matt. Councilmember Silva. Thank you very much. Um, those photographs, Matt, bring back fond memories of... Four weeks, over four years of my daughter running the float for each of her classes. So uh, it was fun times. Few things to report. Um, as my colleagues have mentioned, October 9th was Community Service Day and a few statistics. We had 750 volunteers, which was about 50% more than we were hoping for, which is great. We had 18 projects outdoors as well as we were collecting uh, volunteers were collecting food in our neighborhoods. They distributed 8,000 bags and stood in front of eight grocery stores, of which one of those volunteers was Councilmember Haskew. And we collected, besides the volunteer hours, pushing mulch <laughs> and ground cover out at Heather Farm, there was also, we collected 14,750 pounds of food, as well as $2,650 in cash through all of that work in the neighborhoods and in the grocery stores. And thank you to all of my colleagues for your support of that. Last week, um, the C Chamber Civic Affairs Forum was about redistricting, and it featured Supervisor Karen Mitchoff and former County Administrator David Twa, who is on special assignment with the county working on the redistricting process. I thought hearing about the five scenarios and all of the other permutations of that was very interesting, and the county is currently conducting public meetings on the redistricting process, and so if you're interested in that, visit the county website and attend and participate in that process. It's very important. Last week, the um, Bay Area Water Resources Control Board, it's got a very long name, um, had its two days of hearings uh, from to receive input on the proposed third version of the municipal stormwater permit, and I was one of the participants from Contra Costa County who testified, and I really want to thank public works staff, Steve Waymeyer, Carl Carlton Thompson, Lucille, and the city, other city engineer who basically coached me on um, the ins and outs of all of the issues around the up updated version of the that's proposed and they're looking for additional input. And they seem very receptive to what we were saying publicly. Last week also was a statewide webinar on CalPERS, what's, how, what's happening and what was going to happen going forward. It appears that at the November meeting of the board of CalPERS, they, will, they are considering a lowering of the discount rate, which will basically trigger an increase of our pension costs for all cities who are participants in the CalPERS system. What was interesting to me about the 90-minute 
presentation and discussion, which part of it was by the CEO of CalPERS, was just the, really the explanation of the scenarios that they show that board. And if you want to have, if, if you need a higher rate of return, you have to be willing to absorb the risk for that reward. And with the um, actuarial tables that they have going and their need for cash more frequently and more earlier, those actuarial tables are pretty dangerous if they really just kind of like close their eyes and close their ears. So it's hard to advocate not to lower the discount rate when you know, in fact, that the long-term fiscal sustainability of the program is going to depend on becoming more conservative. And um, finally, I will mention that next week, Cal Cities will be discussing, uh, will be bringing its group of statewide leaders together to discuss strategic priorities for the coming year, for 2022. A lot of, uh, more than 350 local officials, including hopefully all of you, responded to the survey about what the priorities should be and what the issues are, so thank you for that and more to follow over the next four to five weeks. And thank you very much. Thank you, Cindy. And well, ha half of what I had down was already attended by others and talked about. So uh, the other ones that I also attended were the Walnut Creek Garden Club 70th anniversary. So that started in 1951 at Heather Farm. And we we're talking about how different Ignacio Valley Road must have looked in 1951 going down from downtown yeah. to Heather Farm. And uh, it was maybe one road in each direction. We were even wondering how, how much paved it was. It had to have started when it was still a horse ranch because it wasn't a park. <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, then we, uh, at, at the Walnut Creek, um, Walnut Creek Downtown Board, Brian Hirohara is now the chairman of the board for the next year. And, in and the last thing that I did that Mayor Pro Tem Francois talked about, but I judged the Las Lomas floats. So the next day, we had a few members of the school board as well as myself, and we judged the, the uh, different class floats. All of them were amazing, I will say. And uh, that was only one factor that went into the decision of which float won, which I found out that at the homecoming game that Friday night at halftime was announced that the senior class float won. So that was the one that you actually oh, showed the picture of. It's, just, it's always pretty much. You've got yeah. really, 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 well, really. Well, the sophomores did. It, they, they, these, the well, these, they were all terrific floats, but <laughs> it's my duty to announce the senior class one. So, uh, and that's my report. Let me get a temperature reading here. Uh, we're moving into the consideration items. Anybody need a five-minute break? Or yeah. charge on? All right, let's take a five-minute break. We'll be back here in five.
All right, and we're back. Next on the agenda is a consideration item titled Your Parks, Your Future Financing Options and Community Survey. And at this time, I invite the staff to provide the staff presentation. Yes, good evening, uh, Mayor and Council, Dan Buckshy, City Manager, you're stuck with me for the presentation this evening to walk us through the agenda uh, on this topic and the staff report. As you mentioned, we're here to talk about financing options for some of our critical infrastructure and possibly other programs and services. And I do want to highlight that I, I would not dare take this task on by myself, so we do have some additional experts here. We have our Administrative Services Director, Kirsten Lacasse. We have Bonnie Moss, our Communications Consultant from Clifford Moss & Associates. We have Sarah Labatt from EMC Research, who is our uh, polling consultant. And then we also have online Craig Hill and Robert Schmidt with NHA Advisors, who are our financial advisors for this effort. And they have uh, contributed considerably to the staff report and would obviously be available for some questions. Now I can start here. All right. There we go. So I'm going to start with the recommended action, then I'll close with this as, out, as well. There are two uh, recommendations we are seeking or providing and seeking direction on from your council this evening. The first is to provide direction on which funding mechanism or mechanisms you would like us to include in the community survey. And then we'll walk through the time frame for when we would conduct the community survey and asking for your approval of that associated time frame. You're going to flip it for me? All right. <laughs> I don't want to poke you in the head there. So we're going to break this presentation into two portions. The first are the financing options. And then I can pause if your council would like, take questions after that portion, and then we'll move into the community survey, which is a little shorter. Take any questions, then we can go on to deliberation and, and public comment at that point. Next slide, please. So first, I do want to provide a little bit of background. I know your council is very familiar with this, but should anybody be watching this uh, at home or the handful of folks who are here in the audience who may not be as familiar with this, this effort began almost four years ago. It was November of 2017 uh, that uh, we focused your infrastructure goal from the 2017-2019 timeframe on the four facilities that are highlighted here. Considerable work in the ensuing two years to work through various options and ultimately because the cost, the price tag was so much to do all four facilities, it really came down to prioritization and your council did prioritize the replacement of Heather Farm, Park Community Center, Pool and Bathhouse. Next slide please. That was, decision had been given in about December of 2019. As we all know, the pandemic hit a few months later, so we did put the project on pause for a little more than a year. However, this summer, your council did once affirm your commitment to the priority of infrastructure, more specifically this project, and at our August meeting, gave us direction to do further research into funding sources that you can see listed on this slide and options for a community survey or polling about the viability of what the interest, the, what the community may be interested in as well as possible ways to fund that through various tax measures. And that's obviously what we are here to do this evening. Next slide, please. As a recap as well, what we're looking at for facility costs just for the combined pool, bathhouse, and community center, you can see there are low to high end ranges for both the 25 meter pool size and the 50 meter pool size. I'm going to generalize and, and state that generally we were looking at about 40 to $50 million depending upon how the variables play out. But what I can't underscore enough is that this was in 2019. Yeah, and we know that when it was done in 2019, the, the costs were probably six months out of date at that point, just in terms of when it, how much time it takes to gather information. We know the world has changed dramatically. The construction uh, industry is very tight. Labor costs, material costs have shot up significantly. And I, I would guess we're looking at at least 20% higher off the cuff of, of what a likely estimate. So what you'll see this evening is we're walking through the various funding scenarios, our options r related to 50 million and 70 million with likely somewhere in between, probably to the higher side being the more realistic estimate at this point. Next slide, please. And then lastly, before we jump into the actual topic and wrap up the background portion, I do want to highlight 
The Walnut Creek overall is very, very fiscally sound and, and is overall is in good shape. We employ many best practices. Our budget is very sound. And our reason for going out potentially for a funding measure is considerably different than what you see in many other cities. In many other cities, the issue is that their budget is very strained and they're looking at having to make major cuts to programs and services if additional funding is not authorized by the voters. Our situation is a little different in that what we're really facing is a challenge for how to fund new or replacement infrastructure. And just as a recap, as part of your goal setting process in 2017, our Public Works Department did an assessment of all of our infrastructure and determined that most of it is in pretty good shape and can be maintained as opposed to replaced, except for the four facilities we discussed. The challenge that we're facing is, is while there has been very sound uh, budget practices and financial management, we're not immune to the downturns that have occurred. It was a decade ago that the Great Recession hit. Uh, this council and, and staff at the time had to make many difficult decisions, scale back the budget, and had to do the same over the past year and a half uh, as a result of the pandemic-led uh, economic downturn. And as a result, our budget has been trimmed uh, very responsibly, but at the same time, there has not been year-end fund balance or surplus, as it may have been called in the past, from the annual budget to set aside to replace new or future or replacement facilities. And that's what was done in the 20 years prior when there were large balances that money was set aside. But because budgets have tightened, we've gone through two major downturns in the past 10 years, we have not been able to do that. Hence the reason we're having this discussion about how to pay for this potential new infrastructure. All right, so let's dive in to our financing options here. This slide is a summary, which I'll come back to at the end, and I'll dive into each of these three options in more detail in just a few moments. What you can see before you are the three primary options that our financial advisors did an analysis on and, and provided this information. Uh, first being a general obligation bond or GO bond as they're commonly referred to, the second a parcel tax, and the third is a general sales tax. The first two are effectively a property tax increase and ad an increase to the ad valorem property tax. As we know, property taxes are governed by Proposition 13 and they're highly, it's highly regulated in terms of how property taxes can be added to or altered, which obviously require voter approval, whereby a sales tax is obviously more general and is, is applied differently. As you can see there an important component is that the first two, the GO bond and parcel tax, do require a two-thirds voter threshold, whereas a general sales tax is a simple majority. Additionally, I think it's fairly obvious, but it's, it is an important to point out, those that would pay for the PAT taxes are different. Under a GO bond and parcel tax, it's property owners within the city of Walnut Creek that would pay the tax. The general sales tax is anybody who spends money on goods that are taxable in the city of Walnut Creek, and that includes residents and non-residents, and I'll come back to that in a few moments. The other key point from this slide that is worth highlighting are the use of proceeds, the third or fourth row down, in that the first two options are more restrictive and the general sales tax is more permissive. So in the GO bond, the proceeds from that ink tax increase can only be used for capital improvements. It's very specific, cannot be used for operations in any way whatsoever. Parcel tax is a bit of a hybrid in that it can be used for capital improvements or some programs or ongoing costs, but there has to be a very specific and detailed plan for how much would be spent on each activity. And there are strict limitations on how that could vary. So if there are cost changes or estimate changes, it can become quite difficult to, uh, to manage those. And then the general sales tax can be used on any governmental expense that's authorized within our purview. Next slide, please. So moving on to the GO bond, I know it's a, a little bit of an eye chart, <laughs> literally, but uh, what I wanna focus on, as you can see at the top, we have the 50 and $70 million options for a 20-year term. So think of a 20-year mortgage or a bond. And the next two uh, columns, the right of that are 50 and $70 million for 30 years. For purposes of this example, I'm going to focus on the $70 million for 20 years. Uh, that would provide enough funding to uh, 
build the facilities that we noted, which had a, a rough estimate of four, 40 to 50 million two years ago, and so it's probably closer to somewhere in the 60 to 70 million range. But if you look at this, a geo bond is based upon the assessed value of a property. And so uh, it is important to highlight what assessed value is. It is different than market value. As you can see on the, on the lower left of the table, you know, the average assessed value in Walnut Creek of a property is $659,000. Now, I just looked up some information from a realtor uh, in Walnut Creek if I can read my notes here, a single family home is currently sells for about $1.4 million and an attached condo or town home, town home sells for about $600,000. So if we were to average all that, it would be considerably higher than 659,000, which means that many people have owned their home for a while. Uh, the assessed value if you bought your home last week for 1.4 million would be 1.4 million. If you purchased in the 1980s, it's probably around 300,000 that uh, your assessed value is, and hence the property tax is much lower and the proportion of the tax you would pay for this option would vary as well. So on average, what you can see here is a $70 million bond over 20 years would yield an average debt service of just under $5 million. And the average individual property owner, I should clarify, would pay about $109 a year would be the cost to fund that. And again, that would vary considerably. Some it would be higher if you bought more recently, some it would be lower if you had the assessed value. And we would obviously, if we pursued this, really drill into the details to better understand what that looks like. And then again, a geo bond can only be used for capital projects. So shifting gears, whoop, back one please, to the parcel tax. Again, I'm going to zero in on that $70 million 20 year column here. Works somewhat similar to a GO bond, but the key difference is that it is not based upon assessed value. It's based on other characteristics of the property, such as size of the lot, as you can see here, square footage of the facility, type of land use, whether it's residential, commercial, retail, you can set different types of rates. So again, a 20-year bond for $70 million would yield about a $5 million annual debt service or mortgage payment. And as you can see here, the cost based on breaking it out in this manner would be higher to the average property owner of about $180 to $175 per parcel. Um, which is higher than the, the figures of about $110 that I'd shared on the prior slide. Again, uh, this does have more latitude than a GO bond, but still has considerable restrictions in how the funds can be used. So shifting gears then to the third option that we're reviewing this evening is, is general sales tax. And just wanna share for a few moments how sales tax is allocated here in California and more specifically in Walnut Creek. So we do not have a locally dedicated sales tax here. We do not have a locally voter authorized sales tax for specifically for the city of Walnut Creek. There are, however, one and a half percent additional sales tax uh, assessments added in through regional efforts. And I'll come back to those. So if you look to the right side of the slide, 8.75% is the amount if you purchase anything that's subject to sales and use tax. In Walnut Creek, that's the amount paid. 6% goes to the state. Uh, quarter percent goes to the county road fund. And the 1% is allocated here to the city of Walnut Creek. And that is what equates to about $25 million a year here in Walnut Creek. It varies a bit, but that's the round figure. The other three, as you can see, there are regional measures. Uh, half percent goes to Measure X for the county, which was authorized by the voters about a year ago. A half funds CCTA, which all of you are very familiar with, and the other half funds a BART special uh, ballot measure that was uh, authorized by the voters a few years back. So I want to talk through a couple examples uh, just to give you a sense of how this plays out. So. We could look at a quarter cent or a half cent sales tax, and we can look at other increments as well, but these are the two examples we brought forward. You know, a, half, a quarter cent would yield about five and a half million dollars a year, give or take, maybe six million, which likely would not be enough to support the effort we're gonna be talking through. So I'm gonna focus 
on the half cent, but that's obviously subject to discussion and direction from your council about which one to zero in on further. But as you can see in this example, for every $50 purchased in Walnut Creek, an individual would pay a quarter more in sales tax on that purchase going forward. So put differently, and there are different statistics we can use, but looking at our own economic analysis that was done for us in 2018, at that time it was estimated that the median individual income, median not average in Walnut Creek, was about $55,000. So applying that median, it would, uh, at a half cent sales tax, if we were to add that, would be about $83 a year. So it is actually a little bit lower than some of the other options that we looked at. Additionally, if a half cent sales tax were to yield about $11 million for argument's sake, half of that is paid by folks who do not live in Walnut Creek. As we know, we are a regional draw, we get a lot of visitors, so half of that tax would be paid for by non-residents, the other half paid by residents, roughly speaking, and we're furthering doing further analysis on that as well, but that is what our sales tax consultant shared with us. Um, next slide, please. Sales tax does offer a few different options for how to fund. So one of the options that are not as viable with a geo bond or the parcel tax is we could do a pay-go theory up, theoretically, and we talked about these options back in August. This would mean that if the sales tax were authorized, we're collecting $11 million a year, we could collect it for five, six, seven years and then build the structure and not issue any debt. The challenge with that approach is most people who authorize a tax measure want to see something done. They don't want to wait five, six, seven years for the money to accumulate before something's built and then it's close to nine, ten years before they're actually able to use the facility. So what most agencies do is they'll issue debt and borrow up front and then use the proceeds from the incremental tax to pay for that debt. Uh, those are called certificates of participation or COPs or lease revenue bonds, and, and that's the other end of, of the spectrum. And the middle is a hybrid that we talked about previously as well, whereby we could use some of the initial proceeds, gather them for a year or two from the sales tax, use that to get the project going, and then issue debt for when the heavy costs related to construction come in. So that is an option. You know, obviously we would want to try to to minimize the amount of borrowing to the extent possible, minimize the amount of interest that we would be paying over time if we can do so. So then looking at a couple of options here, this is the $50 million option. I'll run through this and then we'll go through the 70 million. So this assumes a half cent sales tax and this would be both the term of the increased tax and the term of the debt if we were to issue debt. So generally speaking, you'd want to structure the additional revenue stream to match the duration of the debt. So let's look at the 10-year column for argument's sake. You can see the assumptions there. The bottom line is if we generated 11 million, about six would be needed to pay for the debt service, which would leave five for other, a year for other program services or other types of infrastructure. Next slide, please. Looking at the $70 million option, if it were to cost closer to that to construct the main facility, as you can see here, same assumptions, 10 years, about 11 million of, of annual revenue estimated, a little over 8 million would be needed to fund that, that debt service, and about 3 million a year would be remaining for other program services or for infrastructure. And just to highlight this, I think it's somewhat obvious, but it is important to to highlight this, if we were to go out further and have a 20-year sales tax and or bond, obviously the annual debt service goes down, which does leave more money for other things. However, we'll be paying that for an additional 10 years and hence would be paying more interest. So those are some of the trade-offs. And if we were to delve into these options into more detail, we'd obviously really scrutinize that to determine which is the best way to go. So I'm going to pause here. This is the summary slide that uh, I started with that outlines the different attributes of the three different types of, of funding options. And I'll pause here to see if there are any questions. All right, let's start with questions. We'll get there and we'll start. Any questions from yeah. Council Member Darling? Okay. Thanks, it's a lot of numbers and I've been sorting through them for a while here. So. Um, starting with the bonds, 
I was looking at the consultant's report and it talks about <coughs> single family residences and shows the um, relative age of the transfer of each of those properties. Is a bond, geo bond, are those typically on single family residence only or do we put them on both commercial industrial and single family residence? I believe they are both, but I'm going to ask uh, Kirsten to verify that for me. Put on? Director, yeah. sorry. <laughs> um, yet they're actually, the geo bond would apply to all properties, all parcels. Okay, so the, the commercial and industrial folks would pay based on their assessed value. Correct, for the geo bond, yes. Do we have an idea, um, you know, the, the chart goes through and shows property transfer dates. Do we know for the commercial industrial if that's a similar pattern to the, the houses or do they transfer less often or more often? That, I don't have that information with me, but likely it would be less often, but we could also um, bring in the consultants as well to answer that. Okay. Let me okay. just add to that briefly as I could. If nothing else, I've always found this kind of interesting. So one of the dynamics of what's occurred since Prop 13 was passed in the 70s, and I'm not opining if this is good, bad, or indifferent, but prior to Proposition 13, more property taxes used to be generated from commercial um, properties. And over time, because there is a less change in ownership, that, that paradigm has shifted, and now there are more taxes generated from residential properties. So while we, uh, Kirsten noted we don't have the exact specifics for Walnut Creek, it's highly likely that the, the change in ownership is less frequent. Okay. Is, isn't it also true that the change in ownership, many of these commercial properties might change 70% of their ownership, but as long as they one owner remains in the partnership, it doesn't nothing it is triggered. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm only being frightened. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm getting this. Um, and, yeah. Um, and then on the, I know with a parcel tax, you can go through and say, you know, you can exempt seniors, you can do different parcel taxes based on the size of a property or something like that. Is there something similar with a bond, with a geo bond? Or does it just, it's just a flat based on assessed value? It's based on assessed value, yes. It's an ad valorem tax, and so it's only based on assessed value. Okay, and is there an opportunity with that to give, uh, say, a senior on a fixed income an, a, a way to not pay it? That's a good question. I don't believe so, but I may have to defer to Mr. Craig Hill, who we also have on the Zoom for that one. Hi, Craig. Uh, hi, go ahead, <laughs> Mr. Hill. Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, the, the short answer is for a general obligation bond, there is no exemptions that can be uh, selectively applied. Under a parcel tax, you could write the tax formula in a way that would uh, provide exemptions for seniors or low income uh, based on some of your other metrics that you use to give uh, refunds or reduct, reduced costs for uh, other services. So yes, it, it is possible. Okay. And then um, now completely switching over to the sales tax side of things. Do we have, I, you know, I appreciate the estimate of what a $50 purchase would charge in sales tax. Do we know for the larger ticket items, say furniture, cars, appliances, do we know if there's any do people shop by sales tax or does that just, does it change the uh, consumer behavior? Do we know? Um, that is a good question. I don't know off the top of my head of defer to Dan. I would think it's unlikely. I don't know if uh, any of our consultants would like to speak to that if they've seen that uh, through other polling or, or other feedback. But anecdotally, I would say I've not heard that's the case, but we'll so defer my, to that. My experts. husband and I just bought a car and we didn't even think about it about where we were Anec buying. Anecdotally, um, 10 years ago, we were having a conversation with the auto dealers and something came up about a sales tax and, oh, wouldn't that be a bad idea because don't you like the competitive advantage of not having an add-on sales tax in Walnut Creek versus Concord. And the dealers looked at that person like he was nuts. No one shops 
the sales tax rate when they're shopping for a large ticket item. That is true. Hi, uh, Bonnie Moss with Clifford Moss. And um, our, my knowledge is that uh, a sales tax is based on your address now for a car. So for the really big stuff, like a car, it's going to be based on your address. I do agree with the statement that, that most people aren't thinking about that sales tax piece when they're purchasing a major purchase, but um, a car would be based on your, your home address. Home address, okay. Um, and then last question. I know we have the quarter and the half cent sales tax. I think, Dan, you and I talked about this earlier this week. You can do other increment. Can you do other increments besides just the quarter and the half? We're required to do only eight percent, eight cent increments, uh -huh. so one eighth. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Um, and then the last question. This is an, another ignorant question. And average debt service is that principal and interest? Okay. Yes, that would be. Okay, I'll pass it on to the CPA for the questions from here on out. That, that, that's okay. I actually understood most of what <laughs> I read, so we're fine. Any other questions? You're, no, you're good on that? Fine. All right. We'll make our way down the road here from Mayor Pro Tem Francois. So thank you, Mayor. On, um, on the sales tax option, is there, is there a limit to how high the sales tax rate can be? In Contra Costa County, the total sales tax rate cannot exceed 10.25 percent. Okay. And we're currently at 8.75. Correct. Okay. Do we have a sense of what sales tax rates are by other cities? Yes. If we look at the county, the average is about 9.1 percent, and there are of the 40 cities, of 13 of those have an additional add-on sales tax. So that's about 33% of, of the other, 35% of the other cities. There are 19 cities in Contra Costa. That, oh, dear. Was that East Bay, maybe? Uh, 33 cities would be Alameda and Contra Costa together. I apologize for that. Um, that's okay. I have the list here. That's okay. I'm kind of getting overwhelmed with statistics, actually. But I like, know. I know. We could just, I know. We, like, what is Concord Charge or Pleasant Hill? What, what are um, the Concord, are they, they do have a separate tax, and their tax rate right now is 9.75%. Okay. So they do have an additional add-on. They, they just added that on last year, right? I think that was. Yeah. The second time. Yeah. And, and then maybe some of the other cities right near us, Pleasant Hill, Danville, Lafayette. Pleasant Hill is 9.25, uh, Lafayette is 8.75, Martinez is 9.75, Danville 8.75. So it, it ranges. Um. Okay, that's helpful. Let's, and then I had a question now for something completely different. Uh, there was a reference in the staff report to if the Community center were built to an essential services hub, and I wasn't sure what that meant. Yeah, let me speak to that one. So certain facilities such as police departments, hospitals, are built to a higher safety standard, primarily earthquake safety standard. One of the things we were talking about that we may want to consider if we proceed with this is for our emergency services operation and center. If we were to build a new facility, we may want to consider building it to that higher standard. So in the event there were a large scale disaster, City Hall currently serves as our uh, emergency services center in the event of a disaster, um, but it is not built to that essential service center except for the PD portion. So it's certainly not a must, but it is a consideration if we were to do this. That's helpful, thank you. Those were my questions for now. Council Member Silva. Thank you very much. I think my only question, it really is involves the flexibility of the three alternative funding mechanisms. So if I'm understanding correctly with a GO bond, not only is it capital only, but you have to be pretty precise because you have to basically ask for the, the amount of money to achieve the objective that you're striving, the thing you're trying to build. Am I correct there? 
Yes. So estimating the cost would be really important because you don't want to estimate that it's $50 million and then have it come up $10 million short and yes, have three correct. walls instead of four. I mean, <laughs> okay. Um, the same thing seems to be true around the parcel tax because you're going to have to be precise about what you're going to. When we did the parcel tax for the library hours, we had to say how many hours we were going to be covered for the number of years, and that was precise in the tax measure language. Is it, so I would assume it would have that same nuance today. Yes. So the flexibility is greater in the sales tax measure because of just the way it's structured and it's not a property tax. But does it also then give you the flexibility of realizing that construction costs go up 30% in one year in your middle of construction and you have to get it done, you're able to shuffle, shuffle the funding around? To the extent that we would have additional revenue from that sales tax measure in addition to what we would need for the debt service, then yes, we would have some more flexibility. Even if we might have to suspend certain programming that it might have been covering, okay. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, I just have one question, uh, and, I, and I appreciate what the uh, additional tax would be if it was a $50 purchase, but essentially, or I guess uh, just in general, what would the extra annual cost be that would average out sales tax for someone if it were a quarter or half percent? Do we have that number? Yeah, that was uh, the figure that I referenced earlier. So if we assume median individual income uh, that I referenced earlier, uh, about 30 percent of one's income is spent on taxable sales is the estimate from the legislative analyst office out of Sacramento, which means uh, based on that income, it would be about $83 a year. $83 uh, per person, okay. Can you walk through that? So that's 50,000 times a third is? About 16,500 and then half a percent of that is $82.50. Per, per person? Per person, so then... No, no, well, that's per income earner. Per so. income earner, okay. All right, so assuming two, even if assuming assuming two income earners, that it's all it's all in the same general ballpark. Well, for Just the one is, the one not, not for the, um, the first general obligation bond. That's a little lower. Yeah, I mean, if you were to do, if you were assuming a, a double working household and they were both earning the median income, it'd be about $160 right. a year okay. for the household. Well, can I ask a an additional question? I mean, this is the, um, but the effect is where for the bond or a parcel tax, all of the funding comes from Walnut Creek properties. On the sales tax for every $82.50 that a Walnut Creek city resident mm -hmm pays into the system, there's probably a doubling down of another, somebody from Concord or unincorporated Walnut Creek or Stockton is contributing the other 8250. So it's, they're, we're leveraging our dollars. Right, right, I was just trying to get my <coughs> idea. No, 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 I, I, I mean. And, 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 in, and to assume a two income family is gonna just simply double whatever they're spending may not be accurate because they may be spending it on non-taxable items like like uh, travel and, and may have dis more discretionary income versus not. And before everybody jumps down my throat and says um, it's a regressive tax, I will say, yeah, it probably is. It's, it's not a brutally regressive tax, but what it does is um, a lot of people contribute a lot more money who have more money to spend. And the people who usually benefit from those dollars that they do spend gets leveraged because rich people are, are contributing into the pot too. So the people who frequently are the people who need our, use our resources the most are essentially subsidized by mm -hmm. the rich people. Another question? Yeah, I, I am curious about that. Um, you know, between the bond, the parcel tax, and the sales tax, I know it's not a, an apples to oranges or apples to apples comparison, but which one is more regressive? I think it depends how you look at it. Um, 
and it depends on the different circumstances and situations. I don't know if, Craig, if that's something you want to weigh in on in terms of what you've experienced in doing these analyses. Uh, yeah, it's actually a really good question. I think the way that we try to look at this from a, you know, a policy or from a, a council's perspective is really um, the equity across the, the, uh, the tax in terms of what do you think the benefit of the improvements or the facility, how should that be shared in your community? And, and very quickly, for a general obligation bond, because it is a property tax based on assessed value and nothing else, you can have two you know, adjacent houses, for instance, one with a family that's been there for 15 years, one that just moves in and um, as the city manager had described as an example, had just bought the house, um, they're going to be paying twice the tax that the neighbor is. Now, I will tell you that under a general obligation structure, as your assessed value continues to grow every year, the tax rate's actually going down. So those folks, as long as they stay in their homes, are going to see a tax actually reduce every year. Whereas on a special tax your, or the parcel tax, it's, it's, it's kind of a hard number that we define early. The voters are, are approving a hard number and it will stay at that, that, that level for the term of the tax because you're going to be some for, for debt and then some of it for programs. So you can look at that and you can say, well, now everybody who's the same house or the same type of house, for instance, single family detached, they're all paying the same. Right? So there's social equity and, and how that is applied. That's really the conversation, I think, um, that we have with a lot of councils around the state when they're trying to compare the two. Um, I will just say from a program perspective, it's, it, the first question really needs to be, would any of these facilities that get improved require any additional funding to operate? And especially with aquatic centers and libraries, those are the two types of projects where the community will want them built and then want them open. And if the city is unable to fund staffing and you know hours to keep them open, uh, you want to look at a parcel tax because it does give you that extra revenue stream, similar to a sales tax measure uh, that can be used for staffing and, and some of the other costs associated with the facility. Yeah. I, thanks, so that was very useful. Um, on a parcel tax, my only experience with parcel tax was Measure AA, which was a 12% parcel tax or $12 parcel tax on everybody in the Bay Area to fund restoration in the South Bay. And that restoration in the South Bay was not described very clearly. It was restore salt ponds, you know, it was like miles of trail, acres of flood control, but it wasn't anything close to 60% design drawings. What do we need to come up if we are going for a parcel tax? What do we need to put together for that as far as describing what we're doing? I would ask that Craig answer that if he would. I, I think the way that we would look at the, uh, the parcel tax concept, if that's where the council wants to go, is we would really come back with a whole matrix of scenarios, right? The, the, the primary objective is how much money do we need to raise each year to cover the, the project financing and or any costs, uh, operational costs, and then how do we dice that up? So, it, you know, it, exempting certain types of parcels, uh, making sure that residential is paying 80% or 70% or 50%. So there's a number of different variables that we can put into um, scenarios. And then you can kind of get a feel for, you know, what, what seems uh, fair and what seems uh, realistic. But right now that, that initial analysis hasn't been done. And we've just given some high level, uh, you know, if, if only all the residents paid, this is what it would be. And that was what we're, was represented in the uh, in the slide earlier. Thanks, Craig. Um, what do we need to describe as far as what we're going to do with the money? Do we need to have specific dollar amounts for projects? Or can we just say we're going to do X, Y, and Z, and they're going to total up about this much? So you're, you're asking about the, uh, the question that's actually on the ballot? Yeah. 
Right. So under a under a, a general obligation bond, you're just simply asking the community, will you allow us to go out and borrow fifty million dollars? Right. It's a real yeah. simple question. On a parcel tax, you're actually asking, will you uh, allow us to levy a tax of X dollars? And you're also asking, you know, for this particular project um, and for these particular services, if that's to be included. Um, and then you're also asking and to, to borrow up to X dollars. So it's a, it's a more complicated question than you have with the GO bond, but it is, uh, those are the three, what are you gonna spend the money on? How much do you need to borrow and what's the tax? On the GO, you don't ask what the tax is. You just ask how much can we borrow? Okay, thanks, that, that helps. Yeah, Matt. I had one more, Craig. When you said uh, for operational or ongoing costs, that parcel tax is the way to go, couldn't you also fund that with a sales tax? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Right. The, 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 I think as the city manager represented, the sales tax actually gives you the broadest flexibility because the money isn't, because it's a general tax, right? You're, you're not telling the community what you're going to spend it on. You are asking, can we raise the sales tax rate or transaction and use tax? And that then falls into the general fund. It's up to the council then to commit it towards the project or towards debt service or programs. So your most flexibility is on the sales tax side, but it's not, uh, it's because you are not explicitly asking the question, can we raise sales tax to build, you know, replace an aquatic center? Uh, there's been communities that have done that and uh, then it kicks it up to two thirds on the approval. So I, yeah, well, I guess we'll get there. Uh, in terms of how you frame the survey question on the sales tax measure. Yeah, I have a question. So with the parcel tax, um, your ongoing costs, um, is there a term limit on the ongoing costs? And, and supposing it's the most wonderful swimming center in the country and it, it then goes um, for a, a more than you think it's gonna go and B, for longer than you go and your general fund doesn't come up and cover it at some point, is that a disadvantage or is there a way to handle that? Or do you just have to go back at the voters when, when you run out of money? Yeah, well, I think uh, some of your polling consultants would probably have a, a better answer, but generally speaking, we, we do have a number of public agencies that, that will specifically ask for a very short time period on a or a sunset on a particular revenue measure uh, with the understanding that we will, you know, trust us, we're going to show you that we can actually do something in in that fixed period of time. Uh, there are many agencies, though, that will, uh, it's a big effort to go out and ask for any kind of a revenue measure, and they will ask uh, that there is no sunset. So, you know, you'll have sales tax measures now that are, uh, do, do, don't have a, a, a sunset. Hi, Bonnie Moss here. Just to add a little more uh, clarity, when we are talking about any one of these options, uh, we strive to be in the feasibility phase with your uh, support uh, to be very data-driven. And so what we're eventually moving toward is a ballot measure package that has what we call a ballot measure summary, the 75 word long run on sentence with a question mark at the end, that essentially in a very deliberate defined way, defines what it is we are asking voters to approve. And there's new laws that now say you've got to include certain financial information in that ballot question as you are also saying, here's what we're going to be using the funding for. And in a sales tax, there are, it's a very general purpose kind of thing. That's where the 50% plus one uh, framework comes from on an already scheduled city council uh, election. And, that, and with that comes the 50% plus one. When you move to a parcel tax or a bond, 
we uh, are very data driven in the polling process to understand where your community is landing in terms of what it is willing to support under what conditions. So the issue of a potential uh, sunset does come up in that discussion and we test it and we learn from it what your unique uh, electric is willing to do. We will also learn what kinds of projects and programs and services your unique community of voters is willing to consider in a potential ballot measure package. So we, um, we use that polling process to help us get very specific in any one of these three models, any one of them. Either way, we're gonna get very specific. I will say, just friendly reminder, getting to that two thirds level is, is a steeper climb than the 50% plus one. Mm -hmm. Okay, if we don't have any more questions, then we can go to part two from the timeline. Sounds good. All right, one more. Okay, so briefly, what we would be looking at if we proceed with the survey, as you can see here on the left side, a statistically valid random survey that would be conducted by EMC research of about four to 500 residents. They would provide us some draft language beginning in mid-November. We would work to refine that. Uh, we're gonna do considerable outreach discussion with your council, potentially with members of the public in order to firm that up. The survey would be conducted the first couple weeks of December, obviously throw the holidays in there. Into January, we would receive the results and plan to report, report those findings to your council at your January council meeting. Next slide. So then bigger picture, how does this play into the overall time frame? So as you can see on the far left, basically now until January would be the community survey piece. Once we have that information, if the council wanted to proceed to the next step, end of January, early February through basically mid-July, we would be having multiple conversations with the community to solicit additional input, refine what we may want to pursue based upon community feedback. And then ultimately it'd be gut check time for the council in July because then there has to be a decision no later than August 12th as to whether or not the matter would be put before the voters Given that you only meet once at the beginning of August, we would not recommend leaving it to just one shot at a meeting in case something goes awry. So we would be recommending we go to council in July to seek your direction as to whether to put it on the ballot. And then you can see there November 8th, the voters would decide and we would either be very busy implementing uh, what we had committed to or would be regrouping, figuring out what to do next. <laughs> next slide. And so then just again, the recommended action, as you can see here, is any direction regarding what funding measures to include in the community survey, and then any feedback on the time frame. Great, thank you. So let's see if we have any questions on the timeline. Any questions, Matt? I think it's for the consultant. Uh, in terms of the timing, uh, is the only reason not to wait or to wait until January because of avoiding the major holidays, or do you have a do you have a reason why we should survey in, in December versus January? Yeah, I'll give my my view on the the communication side that uh, we want to we want to learn as soon as we can where your voters are from the perspective of what they're open to considering supporting, and to preserve that that longer window from January to June, essentially, for the community engagement and listening work that will happen. And if we can poll after Thanksgiving, but before the Christmas holiday, that's a very reasonable time to poll and get those results for January that allows us uh, more time for the listening piece, informed by the research. Would you agree with that? Yes, nothing to add. <laughs> so no reason to wait until January. No reason. Okay, thank you. Don't go away, please. Um, sometimes your initial polling it looks good, and then things happen in the environment around you, 
which affects voter attitudes. Um, would you have you have you found that to be true? <laughs> You're nodding. And the second thing is, what is your um, what's the approach then? A second poll in June time frame, so you get a better read. Hi, I'm Sarah Labat, EMC Research. Great question. Short answer: Yes, things change. A poll is a snapshot in time. It's not a predictive. Here's what will happen in the future. It's a what would happen today, and then. Uh, we usually, in the context of a survey, will include information that helps us put in context what might happen in the future. So I'll start with that. Um, there are all kinds of things we can't anticipate might happen. Um, in our um, planning for this work and the budget for the work that we'll be doing, we do have budgeted a small, uh, by which I mean short, tracking survey that could potentially happen before you're asked to make that go-no-go no go decision. Um, that's an option. We don't have to do it, but it can certainly be helpful, um, especially if uh, either you've exerted a large effort to communicate with your community and you feel that uh, you need to know kind of the impact of that and where do people stand right when you're making the decision, or if something happens in the environment, um, you know, that we need that that wasn't anticipated in the research that we want to, to check so that you're going into it with your eyes wide open about where your community is. So we have anticipated that question um, and we'll work with you on when and how and exactly what to do at that point. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Luella. Um, when I grew up, a telephone poll was the only way to poll. Um, I don't know how many people actually answer their telephones anymore. Um, d d have you modified your your systems so that um, you can get a regular, balanced, necessary, statistically correct poll? Um, yes, uh, I would say we are always, um, always updating everything we do to uh, anticipate and react and be proactive about um, things like dropping response rates, fewer people answering phones, regulations about what we're allowed to do with phone calls about survey research. Um, so this survey we're, we've, um, we'll do for you is multimodal. It'll be online and by phone. So we'll have telephone interviewers that will call landlines and cell phones of voters. We also send email and text message invitations to the same survey to take online. We've really found that those two modes, um, online and phone, are very complementary in terms of our ability to get a robust random sample of communities, um, not just in Walnut Creek, but certainly for Walnut Creek. Um, and, and all over, um, you know, there's really good data on voter files in California. We're a very fortunate state in that way. And they are, have been asking email addresses for a while now, which gives us another option. Um, and so we integrate all of those modes uh, in our data collection in almost every single survey we do. It's very rare that we would do a phone only survey at this point. I'd also say, um, mail is coming back for many surveys. Uh, we're not recommending it here. It has um, a lot of upsides and a lot of challenges in terms of timing and cost, but you know, what's old is new again in our industry sometimes. So we try to really think um, creatively and keep up with the science of opinion research and um, all of the government regulations that govern our industry to make sure that we're able to get the best, um, you know, most random representative sample we can so we can project it with the reliable uh, and known margin of, of error for, for work like this. Okay. And let me just, let me just add as a communications um, person that what we end up with, and there's a bigger and bigger portion that comes online from those who want to take the survey online, but what we end up with is a highly predictive mirror image of who is likely to turn out in a November, in this case, in a November 2022 election from your community because of the tools in the toolkit with EMC, they can manage that so that we're looking at the end in a mirror image of what we know will turn out. So very, very predictive. Thank you. All right, looks like we've got the questions that have been asked of council, so let's uh, turn it over to the public for any kind of qu uh, questions or comments they may have. And if any member of the public would wish to provide public comments at this time, please use the raised hand feature online, or if you would like to provide a public comment in person, please step right up as well. 
For those who would like to provide a public comment on this consideration item, please raise your hand now. As a reminder, each speaker will have two minutes to make their oral remarks. The Zoom feed for each speaker will cut off automatically at two minutes. Written comments submitted have been and will during this item be posted to the city's website for public review and are included in the meeting record but will not be separately read into the record. Also, please note that during public hearings and consideration items, groups, group spokespersons are allotted 10 minutes in lieu of other members of the group speaking on the item. We trust that everyone will follow the rules, and at this time I'll ask the city clerk if there are any members of the public who would like to provide comments. There are no hands raised on Zoom. All right, well, since we have no uh, members of the public who would wish to provide comments, I will bring that to a close, and we'll bring it back to council for any further comments. And uh, we're looking for two, if you wanna bring up actually the the slide showing the two actions that are needed. So on the first one, uh, well, why don't we just go down the line here and we'll hear what we have to say on uh, our provided, uh, the preferred funding mechanism and then if you approve of the recommended community survey timeline. Can I ask you a question? Yep. Um, I think the second one will be easier to answer, but the first one, I think they actually need it. They would prefer a decision from us, provide direction, not just five right. different comments. So no, we we're will. Gonna, yeah, we're going to toss this around. So maybe we start with the second one, just so we can. Get, if you'd like to start with the second one, I, we can I'm do that. Only as yes, I see it as maybe the easiest question to answer, and we can warm up to the hard one. <laughs> sure. Uh, all right. Does let me let's put it this way. If, uh, let's go down the line, and if you would, if you would approve of recommending the community survey timeline for November 21st, 22nd, and we can actually take a vote on that. So if there's a motion for that. Yeah, I, okay. I'm very happy with the timeline. Okay, I call that a motion. Second. <laughs> All right, we have a motion and a second. <laughs> so why don't we take the roll then? Councilmember Darling. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Francois. Aye. Councilmember Haskew. Aye. Councilmember Silva. Aye. Mayor Welk. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Yeah, well, that was easy. All right. <laughs> now we can go home. <laughs> now we feel good. Yeah. Right. All right. So why don't we start uh, at, with, with just general comments on this, and then what I'd like to do here is have the full comments on this, and then we can have, if there's a motion to be made, we'll make that motion. Okay. Um, I appreciate all the hard work that went into laying these out, and I'm glad that the consultant included the parcel tax in there because I think that gave me some additional um, insight into what the different mechanisms can do. Um, because of the flexibility of a sales tax, the ability to um, spread the cost wider, including into the unincorporated areas of Walnut Creek and the other folks who are using our services and are in our area, I am very interested in a sales tax. I recognize that we will have to be very general in how we say, we describe what we're gonna do with that sales tax. There is some risk associated with that. So I would be interested in keeping a parcel tax coming along until we see the results from the polling because um, a sales tax is going to be us asking people to trust us. You know, This is what we're gonna do with it. Um, but we're not going to save it in the ballot. I would like to have, I would be interested in seeing both the parcel tax and the sales tax come along until we get through the polling just to see how that, how the community would view those. Okay. Council Member Haskew. So I've said this before, when I was on the Blue Ribbon Task Force, we spent a long time trying to decide if we should or if we shouldn't and what we should do to raise funds because it was pretty clear back back in those days that we were gonna need some money to go for our um, infrastructure. Um, we then decided on the half cent sales tax. I believe we're gonna go stronger and better if we don't mess our efforts up between something that is, uh, I understand what you're saying, but I think our efforts are stronger and better and actually, in a very real sense, gives us the ability to indicate largely why it's necessary, but if a, an entirely different thing happened for, God forbid, an earthquake or something like that, 
we aren't going to be strapped by any limitations. It is the very most flexible. Our council has always been responsible about our fiscal status and what we intend to do with the money. We do our finances with great transparency. I believe that there is a, a level of trust in our community that, that fuzzying the water, um, and I'm not saying this just to be difficult. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I just think fuzzying the water will make it harder to find out what people really are willing to accept. And um, I, I say we should focus on the sales tax then. It was a half cent in those days. It's going to be a half cent this, this day, too. Okay. Thank you, Luella. Let's go to Councilmember Silva, actually. Um, thank you very much. Um, I, too, appreciated the, um, the information on all three options. And I am, spoiler alert, my preference is the sales tax for um, many of these reasons, but I've also been on the ground in the trenches on both the GO bond and numerous GO bonds and numerous parcel taxes on campaign committees. The problem with the GO bond is, besides the fact that you can only use it for capital projects, it's for debt service, it is almost impossible to explain that assessed valuation when somebody, and when somebody makes a mistake in the math because they're so interested in what they hear from Zillow and Redfin every other day about the value of their home. The math is beyond them, and they will make serious errors which will turn into no votes. The, um, and it is inequitable. Two people in the same house in Rancho San Miguel will be paying very different um, tax rates. The parcel tax, I think, is easy to sell if you're only selling $29 a year. Um, a pizza a month or a cup of coffee a week um, did that for both the library hours and also for school parcel tax measures where you could really sell the number of um, programs that you would be, you know, class size reduction or whatever it was. When I look at the number that is required over a 20-year period, that is a really hard sell. And, and for a very precise list of needs, where I see the sales tax is it is equitable. Everybody who uses pays, whether you use the roads, the parks, the pools, um, the libraries, you get the benefit if you're in the community and you're paying um, at the cash register. And it um, takes advantage of all those who are visiting our region, working here, and getting the benefit of the services we provide. The other thing is it gives us this optimal flexibility, both in terms of the capital projects that we can secure the funding to be able to move forward with, but small capital projects that would be, in a way, I mean, a $1 million project, a $4 million project could come along as well and get tail end, as well as the services, whether it's we want to continue um, extended library hours or sustainability projects or affordable housing funds. Whatever the community might feel is important, we would have the ability to deliver. So um, while I can see that we might test the, I, I would, having had these conversations over the years, you know, the, how difficult it is to test a bond measure and a sales tax measure in the same survey. You basically have to give up time where people can answer questions about their preferences for what it would pay for, which is what I think we really need the information on. I can see the desire to ask about both a parcel tax and a sales tax measure, but I think for all of the reasons, the benefits that the sales tax measure offers, it would be the better choice. So that's where I am. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, I appreciate the, the insight from my colleagues. I am um, still struggling a little bit why we wouldn't ask for the voters to consider, or the survey to ask whether you would consider a sales tax or a bond. I think people respond differently to that question, <coughs> tax versus bond. And I'm not sure that I really completely understand what the complexities would be with doing that. I, the table in the staff report clearly was very helpful in laying out what the advantages and disadvantages 
of both are. And I think that the trick is with the sales tax measure, if it's really, again, if it's supposed to be for general fund uses, then really using it for general fund uses, and a, whereas a bond measure would be a little more targeted and specific toward a potential pool improvement. So I'm falling along the lines of seeing the value of asking in the survey about both. Would you support a sales tax measure? Or would you support a general bond, obligation bond? Okay. Thank you. I uh, appreciate the comments, and, and first of all, I do want to say that, uh, Dan, I loved your presentation because <laughs> it really laid it all out for me, so thank you for the work that you did on that, and, and those numbers, that is something I, I could not have put together, <laughs> I know that, and thank you as well for all the comments, and uh, Kirsten and, and our consultants as well. Um, I mean, we're in a situation right now where we have had the opportunity for many years to, and this is just taking a step back for a minute, to enjoy the fruits of the work that was put together by councils in years and decades prior to this. And this is what we've enjoyed for almost for 50 years in many cases. And we're now at the point that we have to make decisions of how are we going to do this for the next 50 years? And we have to make these hard decisions because we want Walnut Creek to continue to be the quality of life for our children and our grandchildren, maybe, and maybe the, the grandchildren of our children. So these are the kind of decisions that thankfully, I think everyone that's, that's sitting at this dais and many people that are, uh, that are watching from home, we're thankful that they made these hard decisions all those years ago. And now the onus is on us of how are we going to make these decisions? And, uh, and we, they need to be re rebuilt, we know that, remodeled, we've got everything from, uh, from crossing guards and, and a variety of things that we need to look at. And I'm supportive of the sales tax uh, option to the voters for a few reasons. Some that we've heard of from, um, especially from council members Silva and Haskew, is that this puts everybody that is using Walnut Creek services um, in the paying structure for this, that uh, the burden is not solely on the residents of Walnut Creek when much of this usage also comes from these people that are coming from outside Walnut Creek, especially to these areas that are communal areas like Heather Farm and our, and our other community centers. Um, the parcel tax or bonds, the entire onus is on our residents. And, uh, and owners that would see their property taxes increase, in addition, renters could see their, their rents increase because also the property taxes are increasing for the landlords. And I, and I think that it's important to state that, that uh, the obvious here, which is that a 50% plus one vote is much more achievable than a two-thirds vote when, most, when people are going to be thinking no first before they hear the reasons. And if we put too much, as, as uh, Councilmember Haskey said, fuzzing the water, if we put too much at them, typically voters or even on surveys are going to get confused and we're not and we're not going to get the true answers of of what we're looking for in a survey and i think that in this instance we have to use our best judgment as a council of what do we feel is in the best interests of the city what do we feel has the best opportunity to pass and how can we best get that get that message across and i just feel that if we're asking too many questions on a parcel or a bond uh, or, a, um, or a sales tax that it, it becomes much more of a cumbersome survey. So I think that we need to make this decision, this hard decision now of, of the direction that we're going to go. And I think that making this uh, and asking the one question of a sales tax is the one that we're going to get the best response from a survey that we possibly can. And again, these decisions aren't easy, but if we want Walnut Creek to have the same quality of life with modern facilities that can be used for generations, this is the time to make that decision and move it forward. Sure. Council Member Silla. Um, I have a question for the survey <coughs> consultant. <laughs> Sarah, I think you're probably the one at the microphone. Yes, how are you? Yes. So I alluded to the challenge of asking both types of questions. So if you um, have a survey 15 minutes, let's say, and you're asking a series of questions, and one question you want to know is, would they prefer a bond measure or a sales tax measure? Since you can only do 
a short number of things with yes. the bond measure, and you get a broader list. How do you how do you construct yeah. that poll, and have you done that before? Um, excellent question. I think there's a few things we would think about um, if we're testing multiple mechanisms that can um, fund different things. The first is that uh, obviously the ballot questions themselves are different. And what we try to do in every survey is replicate as best we can the environment in which the voter will be asked to vote on the measure. You don't go to the ballot and get, do you want a bond measure or a sales tax measure, right? You get a bond or a sales tax. So the way we anticipate that, um, and we've anticipated it in the budget for this work, is that we split the sample and ask half the people, we basically have two surveys in one, where half the people in the survey get um, the bond measure ballot question and half get, if it's the sale, you know, the other, the sales tax measure, whichever, if we choose two, we basically take everybody, we ask them, some, same, some of the questions are the same. All five, um, all, everyone, it would be 500 total respondents, would get a, bu a bunch of questions the same, but then we'd split them um, at key moments in the survey to ask the different questions about the two kinds of mechanisms. Um, so the impact of that lets us have an independent understanding for um, the different mechanisms, because as was alluded to earlier, the ballot questions are very different. A bond measure ballot question um, has different elements in it than a sales tax measure ballot question. So we wanna make sure that we are not confusing the individual survey respondent by asking them about multiple mechanisms. So that's one piece. The other piece is that these can pay for different things, right? We can't then go along the survey and tell everybody, here's definitely what would happen if you support the measure we asked you about, because we can't commit in a, a general sales tax measure to a specific expenditure right. plan. But you can test so we from would, a list of 10 items, what Yeah, we would, we would essentially are. want to measure um, support for the kinds of things the city would pay for with any of these kinds of measures. Included in that would be your significant um, expenditure categories broadly from your general fund, the kinds of things that you would spend money on if you were to pass a general sales tax measure. We'd also wanna make sure we include in the list of things we ask people about how important those specific expenditures are that we could commit to if you were to go forward with a bond measure um, or a parcel tax measure. So there's a little bit of an art to that piece um, because what we want to do in our work for you is maximize the number of, of interviews we get on all of the questions we wanna use in every way we can. So um, it's hard to explain, but essentially we would have two surveys in one if we did um, two measures two different kinds of uh, mechanisms, your margin of error on those key vote questions is a little bit higher because we're reducing the number of people we're asking that vote question. So to put it more specifically, if we had one mechanism we were testing, we would ask all 400 people taking the survey about that, you've, you've all said sales tax, so let's say that's one we're definitely asking. If we did a survey just about a sales tax measure, all 400 people would get how would you vote on this sales tax measure? If we were integrating a sales tax and something else, either a bond or a parcel tax measure, we'd boost the total number of interviews to 500 with 250 getting each of those key um, vote questions about the revenue measure. So we're, we're a little, the compromise we're making by adding a second mechanism isn't confusing an individual respondent so much mm. as it is um, reducing the number of interviews we have to look at um, for a specific uh, individual mechanism, which when we come back to you, you know, we'll talk about the implications and what um, our, you know, how we advise you use that. But I think that's the, that's really the trade-off from a research perspective. I don't know, Bonnie, if you have anything to add, but that's, okay. We're not confusing voters. You have to be at the, yeah. Well, and that, that is my, before you, before you respond, Bonnie, my concern is that people will, come away with a conclusion that a bond measure could be used to pay for library hours. And we have to basically test a bond measure for what it can be spent on. Correct, and, and I would just say as the communications person who has to make sure that we don't confuse voters. Because then it confuses the survey results. Correct, so I can tell you that there is a science to everything that the poll is doing and that there is meticulous attention paid to a series, a battery of questions about services or facilities 
all the kinds of things we've talked about. And there is absolute precision on group A that will get a ballot question that looks like a sales tax and group B that gets a ballot question that looks like either a bond or a parcel tax. And because of the way the survey is conducted, there is not a risk that people will be confused about, am I, am I doing a bond or am I doing a parcel tax? They're just answering a battery of questions over 15 minutes, and we get the data segregated, sliced and diced in a number of different ways that help us understand if the council says we're interested in two things, we're going to get clarity about really where your voters are having answered all these different questions from all these different angles. And my, my prediction and my hope is that one thing rises to the top that gives us much more information to go out and really start quality listening in the community before you are all asked to make a decision. Just curious from a uh, statistical standpoint, how much margin of error are we likely to get an increase? In, you know, what's our sure. confidence interval going to be? Sure. So, um, if for, we do two, first. Yeah, for 400 interviews, um, representative random sample of likely voters, the margin of error um, on that sample, and that would be one mechanism, right? If we just did one mechanism, is 4.9 percentage points. If we were to do two mechanisms, so increase our total sample to 500, but for each mechanism, 250 get each, the margin of error for those questions is plus or minus 6.2 percentage points. Mm -hmm. And the way to kind of thumbnail what that means is think of a, a bar around every survey response um, that's plus or minus that many points, and that's how that's where you would get the response. That's the response you would get if you could ask every single person in the community 95 times out of 100. That's the <coughs> easy, easy way to understand that. Yes. Yeah. So, Sarah, th <coughs> this is my first rodeo, but it's not yours. Welcome to the rodeo. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, I don't want to get thrown from the cow or the horse or... <coughs> What do you usually? You've exhausted my knowledge of rodeos. Yeah, I mean, what, what do you usually do in the, this situation? Do you test more than one measure for the reasons, the kind of the concerns I had? Maybe somebody would be more supportive of a bond versus a tax. Um, I, Bonnie is telling me what she thinks, but I have the same opinion, which is the more you can focus on what you think you're most likely to do, the better information you can get. The more, um, as Bonnie was pointing out earlier, time is important between when you do this poll and when you go to the ballot, you're, uh, if you're keeping mul multiple options on the table, some of which you don't think you're likely to pursue, you're taking time on continuing to study that, you're taking time on making decisions later that if you made now, you could have more time with the information you need on the mechanism you're most likely to pursue. So I'd say from a polling standpoint and a, and a research process standpoint, one is better because we're going to spend the next couple weeks working with your staff and probably some of you on the questions we're going to ask. And the more time we have to focus on the measure you're likely, you're, you're leaning towards anyhow, we're going to get a better poll with more robust information on that particular mechanism. We can do two mechanisms. I think it, um, it, it doesn't, it, it's not, uh, it doesn't mislead voters at the individual level, but I think people watching your process it, you're making them wait to know what it is you're going to do, um, you know, and, and watching you pursue all of the options. And by the time you get to making that decision later, maybe they've lost interest. I, th I think, you know, I guess from a, I'll speak to the research perspective, which is if you can pick the one you're most likely to pursue for all the reasons you've talked about tonight, you've all given very good reasons, we would recommend you do that now if you can. I don't know, Bonnie, if you have anything to add. I would but. just add simple is better. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I appreciate the insight and your expertise on that. And then I would um, ask if, the, let's say the results come back and say, we won't support a tax. Then, then do you do another poll and ask about <laughs> another? What's the, what's the downside of? You want to go? I'll just <laughs> tell you from my end, we usually, 
Rarely have I ever seen a survey come back that says, no, 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 not in your lifetime, not in, not in, <laughs> not in this, this era that we're in right now. What, what I do generally see is you've got challenges here, there's good news over here, it's going to take an effort we need to listen very well. So it, it is shades of complexity that we get back in the survey that tell us where we need to work and what's possible, what's possible. But generally, I don't see surveys come back that say, no, this is not, not going to happen. They will say you've got to climb. Can I test you a little bit on that? What if it comes back, you know, 50, 49? Is that, does that trouble you? Do you think, oh, maybe we should ask about another revenue measure? Which measure? So I'm going to give okay, the research. 51 and oh. 49, sorry. Which type of, which, which the mechanism, though? Yeah. Um, my research answer to that question, and then I'll let Bonnie give the... Um, <laughs> the strategic answer, um, but I think one of one of the things I was I was hearing from Bonnie's response, which is right, is that we don't just ask one question in a survey. We have a lot of questions that help us understand why they might support or oppose something. We have a lot of questions that help us understand the impact of various types of information that you, as the city, can provide over the course of of the time that you can communicate about it. And we have a lot of information that helps us understand: Is this a I don't want to pay? issue if we get a, a not super supportive response or is it a that's the wrong mechanism or the dollar amount issue mm -hmm. we get all of that from any you know when we build this poll we're going to build it with the anticipation that the answer might be yes you can do something and here's our suggestions on how to modify the thing that you that we asked about in the poll to give you the best opportunity for success and those uh, pieces of advice might be changing the, the amount, right, from a half to a quarter, let's mm -hmm. say, or not doing it at that ballot, but another ballot later, which is, uh, you know, something we look at, turnout scenarios in um, the electorate we choose, right, we're looking at a November 2022 electorate, that is a, you know, a gubernatorial general election, it's the second highest turnout election generally in California for municipal elections. Mm -hmm. um, we might learn it's close in that turnout, but a broader turnout election, maybe the presidential election, it looks better because of the people that are voting. You get people coming out, not always true, but often true, higher turnout is a better environment for a revenue measure. So some of the things we would look at in the data that we get back would be um, not just green light, red light, okay. um, but how, what do you do with this to, to maximize your chances of succeeding and, and I, I'm going to push back a little bit. I've done polls where the answer is red light. Do not do this. But it's never, never do this. It might be your community is not ready for this now for w many reasons, right? There might have been a, a pandemic. There might have been something that, um, you know, is making it difficult. The community might just be very unaware of the need. And, you know, those are the kinds of things we can identify to help you understand, even if we come back with, uh, we're, you know, we don't think the time is right right now for this exact thing that we're not going to come back with. So take your toys and go home. We'll come back with our best recommendations for what can you do um, and what is your community really interested in? I mean, we've polled here in Walnut Creek before um, EMC has and, you know, you have a fantastic community that um, loves you. And so we want to find out the things that they're interested in that they'd be willing to potentially invest in. Um, you know, so that you can take that information, whether you use it on that November election or in the future, um, you know, to get them the things that they want. It's, it's not so much red light, green light. Okay. It's the information we will get from this first survey will help us understand how we need to have a, a larger communi community conversation before you, the council, are asked to put a measure on the ballot. Okay. Thank you both. So I, appreciate, I appreciate that insight. Uh, that, that's you know, good to think about as we decide which what direction we want to go in. So, uh, so let me ask First Mayor Pro Tem, Francois, does this help alleviate or help direct you into your own thought process? Yeah, I, it does. I think that, you know, 
understanding the science of the process more and that it's not just a red light, green light, and that there's going to be a lot of information gathered from this. And it, from what I'm hearing from both of you, your professional advice is keep it simple, ask one question. And in light of that, I would go with your professional advice and focus on the question on the sales tax measure. And so yeah, I think similar. It sounds like we're going to not foreclose. We're going to get enough information that we're going to get good guidance on what we what the community is interested in. Um, so I think focusing on just the sales tax is the right thing to do at this point, so knowing moved. that we'll get a lot of other information with mm -hmm. So moved. We have a motion. Oh, was that a motion? That is. Sounds like a motion. <laughs> that is a motion. I was about to make a motion. Um, I was also going to say that we will be honest when we present everything and, and essentially um, establish community expectations, even with the sales tax. And so we are making, as, as the process goes along, we do make an implicit promise to them, and it's not likely to be undone. My motion is that we... We uh, have the motion. I made a motion. We oh, have the motion. Do you want to second it? I did, yes. Oh, did. Yes, I do. Second. All right, we have a motion <laughs> and a second. <laughs> Let's call the roll. <laughs> Councilmember Silva. Aye. Councilmember Haskew. Aye. Councilmember Darling. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Francois. Aye. And Mayor Wilk. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. All right. Uh, I think we're at the, uh, end, of the end of the meeting. All right, so uh, we will adjourn this meeting until our next meeting on November 2nd. We look forward to seeing uh, you a lot over the course of the next couple of months and beyond. Thank you. Thank you.